plan that you all uh, adopted back in November of 2020. And on that work program, it kind of dictates what different things um, myself and the community development department uh, need to do over the next five years to address some issues related to housing in Newburgh. And one of those was a line that said car camping. And so um, I took that as an opportunity to get some help considering that I had um, five other things to do on the work plan for this year. And uh, the Portland State University uh, Master's in Urban and Regional Planning Program has a workshop um, project, which is basically, basically like a thesis kind of presentation and project for um, master's students in their urban and regional planning program. And so um, the Portland State University sends out a request for proposals. And so I submitted a proposal asking for planning assistance on looking up researching car camping for the Newburgh area um, and kind of just getting some insight on what that looks like here in Newburgh. So luckily we were picked as one of the uh, projects there were seven total, I believe, um, to, to get assistance from the planning program at Portland State. So I'm, I'm very happy that I had their assistance. I had um, help from six other planning students and they'll introduce themselves in just a little bit here. Uh, but so that's my introduction for you all, kind of the background of what, how this came to be. Um, again, this is kind of like their thesis project that they did for their master's program. So. It's a lot of hard work that they helped us out with over the last six months, and um, I'll go ahead and uh, pass it on over to them. Thanks. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Mary, um, and we will take it over from here. So based on what was called for in the city's project request, we highlighted three specific uh, project goals. Determining the need for this service in Newburgh, this meant both looking into how many people might be car camping, but also whether these individuals felt safe or that they had the services they need. Gauging how other cities have addressed car camping, specifically what other programs look like and whether they've been successful in terms of providing safe parking options with minimal complications and surveying implementation options for a potential car camping program. And with these goals in mind, the first step is to understand who is car camping in Newburgh. So as Ryan mentioned, the first step in our process was to identify the realities of car camping in the city of Newburgh. We understand that car camping has a relative low visibility in Newburgh, but it is happening. We found that the circumstances that drive an individual to car camp are unique and varied to each individual case, but we did identify some common circumstances. Uh, the first one is households who are car camping while they seek long-term housing. Uh, secondly, households who are electing to car camp rather than using other shelter or housing options. And finally, households who may occasionally car camp when other shelter is not available. This may look like somebody who spends most nights on a friend's couch, but occasionally will spend a night or two in their vehicle. In our engagement process, we heard 14 secondhand accounts and two firsthand accounts of individuals who have car camped or who are car camping in the city of Newburgh. And tonight I'm gonna to present a long form of a day in the life of one of the accounts that we heard. Jane is a single parent. She has multiple children. She grew up in Newburgh and she currently works in the city. Her family narrowly makes rent each month. And due to an unforeseen medical emergency, the family falls behind on rent payments and is ultimately evicted from their apartment. Following the eviction, the family is temporarily electing to sleep in their vehicle as they seek a new market rate housing option. However, Jane is unable to find an apartment that can both accommodate her family and which she can afford. This process is made especially difficult because Jane finds herself unable to pass rental barriers, including a rental history check and the production of a down or a security deposit. Jane and her family uh, access shelters in Newburgh, but report feeling unwelcome in the shelter options that they have available. One shelter could not accommodate the family's pet and another shelter the family was unable to abide by the strict schedule and rules. After a few short stays, she decides that her family would be best off sleeping in their vehicle as she waits on an affordable housing wait list. While living in their vehicle, Jane spends hours daily ensuring that the family has access to toilets, bathing facilities, food, laundry, and a place to dispose of their garbage. Every evening, Jane attempts to find a spot where her family can park their vehicle and safely sleep for the night. 
During this time, Jane is ensuring that her children are attending Newburgh schools and after school programs, as well as attempting to pick up shifts at work when she is able. Half of her family's budget is spent on fuel to ensure that their shelter and primary mode of transportation, their vehicle, is able to get them from location to location. This includes shuttling the family and all of their possessions to school each morning, potentially Jane going to work, coming back to pick the kids up from an after school activity, and then attempting to find a spot in the evening for which to uh, park their vehicle as they sleep for the night. The other half of the family's budget is spent almost entirely on food and basic necessities for the family to get by. Without access to kitchen facilities, the primary diet is fast food uh, or food banks and uh, soup kitchens, which they can access within the city of Newburgh. Just handling daily survival consumes an immense amount of James, Jane's energy and time and causes a great amount of stress to her and limits her ability to uh, pick up work shifts and have any regular schedule at work. When the family does manage to find a safe place to park most evenings, sometimes neighbors will ask them to move their car or the neighbors will report their car to parking enforcement. Jane recounted negative interactions with law enforcement who when respond, responding to the parking enforcement complaint had nowhere to point fam Jane where her family could safely park for the evening. Cumulatively, the family spends 24 months living in their vehicle in Newburgh. And for 18 of those months, Jane is on a wait list for a subsidized housing unit within the city of Newburgh. When Jane and her family finally receive subsidized housing after their long wait, the painful memories remained. Looking back at their experience, Jane recounted with relief the ability that she had to park multiple consecutive days at some church parking lots within Newburgh. But without any sort of car camping program, these arrangements were always semi-permanent. Jane recounted that her family would have greatly benefited from a place where they could consistently park their vehicle, as well as access to waste disposal areas and bathrooms for the family. Had such an area been, been available to Jane and her family, she believes she would have had a lot greater ability to focus her time and energy on the plethora of challenges the family faced every day. We found that there is not a liaison organization to the car camping population, nor is there a complete understanding of the population which is car camping in Newburgh. Therefore, we recommend a more rigorous approach to determining the true number of people car camping. Anecdotally, we believe there to be between nine and 20 households who are car camping. Included in the report are 14 additional short accounts of households who have experienced car camping in Newburgh and who could be supported by a program that allows for safe car camping. This list is not an extensive account, nor is it an attempt to identify what the average car camping site participant might be. The hope is that this list of stories can be used as a way to compare how different implementation options and actions may better serve different groups of car camping people. Now that we know who's car camping in Newburgh, we can go through the other relevant background information and research that led us to our potential implementation options. And I will hand it off to Katie. All right. Thanks, Ryan and Paul. Um, I saw that comment, so I will try and speak up and hope that the people in person can hear us. Um, so as the council and commissioner aware, Newburgh is facing several housing challenges that are similar to those in other communities across Oregon. One, Newburgh's population has grown a lot faster than the number of new housing units. A regional housing needs analysis that was done in 2020 estimated that the city needs 916 additional units of housing to meet the current demand. Two, the city's housing stock is relatively homogenous, and it's made up of mostly single unit dwellings or single family homes that tend to be less affordable. And three, Newburgh has high rates of cost burden households. These are households that pay more than 30% of their monthly income on housing expenses. These kinds of challenges deteriorate residential stability and increase the risk of houselessness for Newburgh's residents. In 2020, which is the most recent data we were able to get for this project, there were an estimated 277 of Yamhill County's houseless residents living unsheltered, and 14% of those individuals were living in vehicles. To meet the housing needs of Newburgh's houseless population, a regional housing needs analysis estimates the city will need 229 units of housing specifically to serve people who are experiencing houselessness, and the majority of those must be very affordable. 
So until the city is able to address all of its housing needs, there need to be interim options available for people who have been most impacted by the housing crisis, Newburgh's houseless community members. Next slide, please. So this evening, we're going to be talking about car camping programs as one of those interim options. A car camping program is not the solution to addressing the needs of Newburgh's houseless community members, but it could be one of several options available for people who are houseless until there is sufficient affordable housing for those who need and want it. Uh, car camping programs are most frequently referred to as safe parking or overnight parking programs, and they provide a place for people to stay who are living unhoused in their vehicles. Most cities have laws that effectively criminalize living in a car, such as limits to how long someone can be parked in one spot. So at a minimum, these programs address that issue by providing a place where someone who is unhoused and staying in their vehicle can go and stay to avoid costly citations, potential impounding of their car, which doubles as their shelter and their belongings, and where they can gain a basic measure of safety. Uh, these programs also generally provide hygiene facilities and some provide additional services like case management. Car camping programs are not a housing solution though, they're an interim tool to help address immediate needs and attenuate harm for people who are living unhoused in their vehicles. Later in the presentation, we are going to talk a little bit more about how a few of these programs operate in other Oregon cities. We went about gathering information from local stakeholders in a few different phases. In the first phase, we reached out to experts and stakeholders in the Newburgh, Yamhill County, and Greater Portland areas who have experience working with the houseless population. Through these conversations, it became apparent that car camping is something that is happening in Newburgh, despite being less visible than in places such as Portland and a program to manage the car camping would be beneficial. While everyone we talked to agreed that the services in conjunction with the program was a good idea, there was some variation in thought on what those services should be and how required they should be. During the second phase of engagement, we had some interviews with houseless individuals to try and get firsthand information on what it is like to be someone living in a car in Newburgh. We also gathered a group of stakeholders from the Newburgh area for a focus group. This group included people we had already spoken with, but also included invitations to other stakeholders in Newburgh, such as the Chamber of Commerce, Library, and Parks and Rec Departments. We discussed what potential programs could look like and how that would impact the different stakeholders and the people they represented. From this conversation, we found that a majority of the stakeholders we spoke with felt that the city partnering with a service provider and having a more in-depth program was the best of the options. This will be discussed more later, as will further engagement outreach recommendations. Next slide. So uh, to supplement the engagement, our team conducted research on how existing car camping programs are implemented and operate including what elements of programs are codified or left to be decided by host sites. And through interviews with planners, we learned about what's necessary for a successful program, as Mary mentioned, including a partnering with a service provider. In total, we researched uh, 14 programs and jurisdictions in Oregon and Washington, as well as state policies. Commonalities across programs include requiring bathrooms, hand washing stations, and garbage disposal as well as limiting the number of vehicles allowed at each site. We looked at standards for when and where car camping can occur, including limiting programs to specific zones, specifying setbacks of vehicles and storage containers, as well as setting hours of operation. A comprehensive audit of Newburgh's municipal code was conducted to identify if they should codify a car camping program and how. Uh, the city must address existing areas of your code, which define uh, terms such as vehicle and dwelling, as well as what you consider to be a discarded vehicle. And our research found that the most successful programs only codified what was essential, which allowed for flexibility on a site-by-site -site basis. And the state set a precedent for implementation of a car camping program with the Oregon Revised Statute 203082, and that allowed cities to permit religious institutions to host up to three vehicles in their parking lots. And they required the bathrooms, hand washing facilities, and garbage disposal mentioned earlier. 
That statute has since been amended and they removed the three vehicle limit. And they also now permit any public or private entity to host a car camping program, not just religious institutions. In addition, House Bill 2006 legitimized car camping on a state level by updating their definition of transitional housing to include parking lots for individuals or families to reside overnight in motor vehicles. Next slide. All right, so we're going to talk about a couple of different cities car camping programs to give you an idea of what these look like in other places. Every city we looked at runs their programs slightly differently. So these are just a few of many potential options for a car camping program. Um, the image shown on the screen is a site plan courtesy of the city of Bend for a car camping facility that is located at one of its churches. The city of Bend allows car camping in two different ways under its code. First, it allows three vehicles to use a parking lot owned by a business, a religious organization, a nonprofit, or a public entity. The property owner has to provide hygiene facilities, but they don't need to apply for permission from the city to host three vehicles. Second, the city then allows up to six vehicles or tents on the same types of properties, but this requires an application to the city beforehand. Under this part of the code, the city can permit public entities in particular to host over six vehicles with additional requirements. All sites have to provide supervision, case management, or supportive services, have site policies in place, and notify neighbors that they are going to operate. So essentially, when the city allows more cars, they require more from host sites. There is a service provider in Bend that runs several of these sites. The city does not give them any funding for their car camping program, but they do fund other services that this service provider runs. And the same service provider also runs car camping sites in the nearby city of Redmond, which does um, fund that program there. Next slide. And a quick look into McMinnville. Uh, the city implemented a car camping program through an ordinance and the program as outlined in their municipal code defines applicable terms and provides an overview of what is and isn't allowed. And it's essential to amend or create definitions to terms that pertain to car camping programs. For instance, in McMinnville, family is defined, defined as two or more persons related by blood, marriage, adoption, or other duly authorized custodial relationships. And this is important because their program allows up to one family to camp in a residentially zoned property, either in a tent in the backyard or in the driveway in a single motor vehicle. The code outlines what's required of hosts, again, sanitary, garbage, and storage. And the city of McMinnville outlined what is prohibited as well. And for them, it, it allowed an opportunity to regulate car camping. Uh, so not only where they prevent it from happening, but where they allow it. Next slide. Thanks, y'all. Um, so through our extensive research, research and stakeholder engagement efforts highlighted by my colleagues, uh, we have prepared three potential implementation options for a car camping program in Newburgh. These implementation options represent the spectrum of possible frameworks the city could choose from and are not intended to be viewed as programmatically binding but rather as preliminary outlines that can help to guide additional engagement with Newburgh residents in the ultimate decision-making process. So the purpose is to assist the city in envisioning a car camping program that would best reflect the Newburgh community's values and meet the needs of those being served. So firstly, option one, the host oversight framework would allow a host site to self-initiate and administer their own car camping program through a simple registration process with the city of Newburgh. This option would likely be run by staff and or volunteers of a faith-based organization capable of self-funding and willing to utilize their own property. This option would require essentially no oversight from the city of Newburgh and program violations would be enforced on a complaint base basis. Option two would allow the city of Newburgh to add a relatively higher degree of structure to a car camping program through additional oversight performed by the city. This includes an initial review of the host site and annual compliance checks to ensure programmatic standards are being met. The host site would also be required to provide an annual report on program metrics. 
Under this option, the city of Newburgh may consider earmarking a limited amount of funding that would be available to host sites in the form of grants. This would allow the host sites to apply for financial assistance in order to offset some of the costs associated with operating a car camping site. And lastly, option three, the service provider oversight framework is predicated on the city of Newburgh contracting with a service provider to administer the car camping program. Under this approach, the service provider would be responsible for the overall management of the program, including identifying and registering the host sites and assisting them with meeting program requirements and coordinating sanitary facilities. The service provider would also be able to refer prospective program participants to the program and would provide intake, case management, and client assistance services. The option would likely require the city to provide some form of funding to the service provider in order for them to be able to effectively operate the program, including assisting program participants in securing stable permanent housing. And it is important to emphasize that there is not a quick fix for getting people into housing. Relationship building is key. Uh, many program participants may require long haul support in order tra to transition into stable permanent housing. And experienced service providers are seen as the best position to deliver on this. As Mary mentioned previously, we solicited feedback on these three options during the focus group conducted with stakeholders who have expertise and community interests and the needs of local houseless population. And from their perspective, option three was widely regarded as the ideal implementation framework uh, for the city of Newburgh to pursue. Next slide. Thanks, Scott. In addition to the potential implementation options, Camellia Planning created a design guide to assist with additional decisions that would need to be made if a car camping program was to be implemented. This guide highlights both design and administration, as well as community engagement actions that we believe the city should take if they want to pursue a successful program. These actions exist as important decision-making points which determine what a program would look like and how it would operate. For design and administration actions, the city should determine the basic programmatic framework they desire, whether a program should be implemented on a pilot basis or ongoing, what kind of registration and or application process host sites should need to follow, if there should be oversight of car camping sites, and if so, who would be providing this service, what kind of program metrics will be collected, where car camping host sites would be allowed within Newburgh, and what other requirements sites should have surrounding things like services, number of vehicles, and other operational details. On the community engagement end, these actions emphasize specific stakeholders that would need to be engaged further for successful program implementation. Those with lived experience, faith-based organizations, local law enforcement, and the broader public should be included as part of a collaborative implementation process. In addition, we believe that a potential program should be communicated to the public in a way that highlights its community building impact. Our full final report has a more in-depth explanation and reasoning behind each action. In addition, each action has corresponding recommendations that provide um, clearer and more incremental steps for implementation. Overall, the implementation decision guide is a tool for making sure that a potential program would best serve both the car camping community of Newburgh and the city as a whole. Next slide, please. We have a few um, questions to ask specifically to council and planning commission to get some feedback for the Newburgh city planners but we would like to give you all an opportunity to ask any clarifying questions on the information we presented before that. All right, questions, anyone? Uh, planning commissioners, you all as well. So any questions? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm not sure if this has to do with your presentation, but previously this has been attempted before in the city of Newburgh and due to break-ins from some of the people camping, it was abandoned. Is there any uh, requirements going to be for insurance 
by any of these persons or due to new laws, is that no longer an issue? And that might be more of a staff question too. That is a great question. I can speak to that a little bit. In the full report, we do have some information from other programs regarding to um, criminal activity increase, decrease, stayed the same when they implemented their program. We also have that included as one of the follow-up items that would need to be included in further research, depending on what program the city would like to look into further. Wonderful, thank you very much. And I'll just add a little bit on to that too. I'm not sure, are you talking about like liability insurance? Yes, that's kind of from looking at old documents, what I gathered from people that were car camping previously had broken into other properties and it became a legal issue in the past. Yeah, so we tried to get some information on that. There is not a lot of research about car camping programs, um, but so it's more like case studies from different places, but that was mentioned in a few, and it seems like it kind of varied as to whether or not it was required, if it was a barrier for host sites to obtain it. Um, I do know one city that we spoke to that provides funding to a service provider to administer a car camping program. Um, they do require them to have liability insurance, and that's just kind of part of their standard contracting language. Um, so we ran into it a little bit, but it seems like it does vary. Was there any information showing consistently what the crimes were about? Were they trying to find gas money? Um, things like that. And can that be provided like uh, vouchers for gas in the future from those ser service areas? That is something that uh, other jurisdictions have done. Um, Beaverton in particular, they have provided gas vouchers. Um, additionally, Beaverton, we talked to uh, the police who did not have any noticeable increase in crime. And you could expect any crime that would be handled in a parking lot to be handled the same way it would be in any other part of the community. Um, but we, we spoke to the chief of police in Beaverton and, and he didn't see an increase. But yeah, it's a, to answer that question, they do provide gas cards and uh, yeah, in our wider recommendations, you could see what other service provider, um, what else they can offer in addition to gas cards. Wonderful, that's wonderful information. They have a diverse population over there. So that is good to know. Thank you. All right, other questions, folks? Yeah, uh, Jeff Musel from Planning Commission. Um, I'm just curious if you have uh, metrics that kind of show a, a sweet spot of success on the programs with um, less city involvement versus, you know, all the way up to having a service provider. Like, do your, does your research show that the service provider is a good investment or is it something that overall you've seen that is just better left to uh, individuals, agencies, things like that, um, that aren't part of the city? Thank you. I can start that one and then let my colleagues jump in. One of if the you things- could speak up, I'm sorry, if you oh. could speak up so the audio can hear, that would be great. Thanks so much. Of course, can you hear better now? That's awesome, thank you. Okay. One of the things that we found in our research is every city defines success differently. And so a lot of the programs are structured differently because they have different goals. So it became very difficult to compare them to each other as they were trying to do different things. One of the things we recommend in the design and administration guide is determining what the goals are for the city of Newburgh to frame success around that. But I will let my colleagues um, jump in if they have further comment. I would just add that anecdotally, it seemed to be essential to have a relationship with the service provider. Um, uh, and in one instance, a lot of the administrative uh, things were handled by the city as far as locating sites uh, where they should be um, and uh, contracts with host sites and then all of the kind of interpersonal 
face-to-face -face relationships with um, people participating in the program and, and, and uh, setting goals for them was done by the service provider. Um, and in, in my experience, from what I heard, I found that, that to be uh, the most meaningful type of relationship. But yeah, I think anecdotally, the uh, relationship with the service provider is essential. Thank you. Other questions, folks? Go ahead, Jefferson. Um, did any of the cities or programs that you looked at include um, a review from other community members, much like we would do for uh, short-term rental? Um, you need to post notification to, to neighbors that you're gonna conduct the process and, and look for feedback. Anthony, were you gonna speak to that or did you want me to? Okay. Um, so none, and someone jump in and tell me if I'm correct, none of them had that process that we looked at. Um, and that, so that was 14 in the state of Oregon, I believe. And all of those were done, processed more as like a staff reviewed application. Um, there were at least a couple, I know Bend in particular, they require notifying neighbors when a site is going to start operating but it's not a like how do you feel about this that impacts the decision that comes after they've already allowed the site it's just more of a hey this is happening this is who to contact if you should have any concerns with it so um it sounds like it's not processed in the same way as that short-term rental application yeah, I would say similarly, I'm unsure about how the short term rental applications work, but Milwaukee uh, required a lot of notification as far as posting the, the sites. But the interesting thing, they were they were doing a very kind of preliminary test case. They wanted um, to allow one vehicle at one single church, and they were going to do that up to uh, uh, three times. So that so they were kind of testing the waters and they, and they did require site posting. Um, but that that was the only one I'm familiar with. I know that the service provider Reach, um, who is contracted with the city of Redmond and also provides services in um, Bend as well, um, had a template of sorts to um, provide information to neighbors that immediately abutted um, potential host sites. So I believe we included that template in resources that were provided to city staff. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's completely applicable to the application and process that you're speaking to, um, sir, but um, yeah, it, it does sound like some um, jurisdictions and service providers do go through a similar process. Thank you, Mike. So um, did your report show a difference between those who are actually needing a place to, to stay compared to those that are living in their car by choice and just wanting to skip through life, uh, so to speak, or is there also a difference between or an increase of people that with mental health issues that were wanting to be a part of that program? Um, did, did you see anything in regards to that? Uh, so we struggled to quantify who the potential user base in Newburgh might be. So what we've included is all the accounts that we heard, but it is not an attempt to quantify who might be using a program. Uh, speaking to McMinnville, their program uh, with Encompass does specifically have intake interviews where they do interview people who are seeking the service before allowing them into the program. So that is one method in order to identify who might be using them and then best place, they have multiple site options within the city of McMinnville, best place that household to the site that is most compatible with their experience. Uh, but one of our recommendations is for further work to be done to identify who might actually use this program in the city of Newburgh. Uh, the story that I presented was anecdotally a case of somebody who was looking for permanent housing in Newburgh, but we were unable to quantify any number of who how universal that experience might be. Other questions, folks? Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for how that might be accomplished. Sorry, can you clarify? I know you're uh, reflecting on the previous question, but can you clarify yeah, how, what, 
yes. how we would accomplish um, estimating the number of people who would need this service within uh, Newburgh. The other thing I was wondering honestly is um, if you collected any cost data particularly associated with that third option. I can speak to the first half of your question, recommendations. Um, we recommend that the city work with existing providers in the Newburgh area who have relationships with this population. The short-term nature of our involvement in this project prevented us from developing those relationships, um, which are important when asking people to share aspects that are difficult about their life. So we do recommend that the city works with different groups who are already established in Newburgh to develop relationships with the houseless population to better quantify who and for what reasons people would be using this type of service in Newburgh. And I'll let a colleague speak to the cost. When I'll just add on to what Mary was saying too, one of our recommendations, well, two of them, I guess, that kind of speak to that question of yours is that we recommended starting out with this as a pilot program um, if the city was to move forward with it because I think we weren't so sure like how high the demand of this would be. And then one of our other recommendations was to um, make sure that sites collect metrics on how many people are using the service so that the city could also use that as a way to start to build an understanding of how significant of a need um, there is for that. And then um, just looking at our report really quickly, speaking to the cost estimates. So they are in there, um, in particular with that option three with the service provider involved. Um, we didn't get quotes from all of the cities that we spoke to, but the ones that we did came in around 20 to $45,000 a year. Um, and that would cover like uh, staffing, sanitary facilities. So oftentimes they provide um, like porta potties and garbage services to sites um, and then case management and other services. So it's not um, without an expense, but it's also kind of a barrier price wise um, from speaking with service providers for a host to do that themselves. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling to this other cost. So a service provider in Compass CM Hill Vet Yamhill Valley that works out of McMinnville um, gave us some quotes for what they um, pay for their program. And so toilets, for example, were about $250 a month for um, ones that were serviced weekly. And then um, garbage, we tried to get a quote for the city of Newburgh, but it varies so much at commercial sites, we weren't able to do that. Um, but Encompass Yam Hill Valley spends about $125 a month on garbage per site. Um, so that can add up. Okay, other questions, folks? Go ahead. I uh, have one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and just to follow up, if I would, if you could, and I don't know how much research you actually did into this, but, um, you know, just from, people I've known that have experienced car camping, you know, including myself as a child. Um, do you see it as kind of an apples and oranges between um, street homelessness? Because um, I know some, a question about problems or someone choosing to be homeless was brought up. But to me, it seems like car camping is almost always transitionary, that they're um, looking for something to get a step up versus, um, you know, like someone who chooses to be on the street. Uh, is that something you can comment on anecdotally or I'm just wondering? Yeah, I would say that's a that's a great point to bring up. And uh, something that um, kind of verifies that idea is that uh, some programs had time uh, limits. Let's say they could participate for 30 days. And uh, if they needed more time, you know, they would meet with the case manager, discuss what their goals were, were and perhaps were allowed to spend more time at the site. So in partnering with a service provider, they're building a relationship to ultimately transition out. Uh, in many cases, I obviously can't speak to all cases. And in a Newburgh specific context, one of the service providers we worked with anecdotally believes the most common circumstance is somebody who is doubling up and one or two times a month may sleep in a vehicle. 
uh, and they think that would be the most common or most numerous occurrence of car camping is when your primary housing option is unavailable for any number of reasons. We also spoke with the McKinney Vento coordinator in the Newburgh School District who uh, shared, you know, in their experience with particularly students in Newburgh um, experiencing car camping, they found it to be very occasional and temporary. So I believe you are correct in your assertion that it is more transitional. Okay, other questions? Again? All right, uh, I guess just back, back to one, and I don't know if you folks look this, back to the question on insurance. I heard anecdotally from a, I'll just put it this way, a church in the, uh, down, in the in-town area that had been providing camping to people, um, but they found that their insurer would no longer allow them to do so. Did you encounter that in your research at all? We did ask, I'm blanking on specific city right now, but we did ask a couple of cities and that also seemed to be a variable thing. Um, and I believe one of the case studies that I read, it also varied there. It was like for one, it was no problem and it didn't actually cost them anything more because they were getting their insurance through, I believe it was like a an insurer that worked with multiple local churches and so that didn't actually cost them much more money but then there have been other cases where that was prohibitively expensive so I think we just didn't find anything consistent in terms of the liability insurance because we did try and dig into it a little bit All right, thank you any other questions folks no all right I, this is commissioner oh. capri um, I have a question kind of more wanting to see which way you're feeling it goes. I can, is there any kind of a application that the people fill out and that they have to meet certain requirements to be allowed to do that? Is some of the things more higher than the others, like having children that need to go to school and that they're trying to get into affordable housing, or I, I love all of those reasons for doing this. What I don't love is I have property and it was um, taken over by car campers. But they're not just car campers, they're people that have RVs or they have trailers or they have campers and they get these and then they leave them. And I spent about $10,000 last year just picking up their trash. So then that leads me into saying from an insurance standpoint, I know the county considers it of the property owner's responsibility for these people when they come on their land. So I don't know how you decide and how do you keep the other ones off? Because I heard a question about drugs. The, the guys that were out at my property, most of them through the outreach people, the homeless outreach people, we're on drugs, heroin. Um, so it's just a huge, it's a huge to me moral issue. I would love to help families in need that have children that need to go to school. My brother car camped 40 years ago while he went to college. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's something that, but he was going to college and he graduated. So that's all. I, it's more of a statement and kind of a question of how well these people are vetted. Thank you. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, that is the good thing about Newberg getting to design their own program. There is no current definition for car. And so Newberg does get to decide what qualifies as a car for this program and what type of restrictions they would like to have on who's able to participate. 
beyond that, um, unfortunately, situations like yours would continue to be handled the way they are. The benefit of a program versus maintaining the status quo is that it gives the people who you mentioned you would like to help, such as the families, a legal and safe way to be where they are so that they are not suffering consequences caused by other individuals. And as Mary mentioned, it's up to the city of Newburgh, if, if chosen to, to set parameters and a relationship with a service provider, again, would be another opportunity to, to uh, set parameters and set goals for participants, whether, whether they chose to implement a program like that or not. Um, yeah, so, that, so, so some of those things you mentioned, uh, yeah, it can be assessed in the sense of preference as far as uh, who's needed in the program, but that would be a relationship between the city of Newburgh and the service providers. There are, there are some, some uh, no alcohol, no drug policies. How, how that's enforced, uh, you know, up to them. But, but yeah, there are different parameters that can be set by the city and by a service provider if chosen. All right, other questions, folks? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I know you mentioned that the measures of success were very different between programs, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little more about what some of the different programs considered to be success. Uh, and particularly, you know, when you consider towns that are comparable to Newburgh within Oregon in size, general makeup, et cetera. I will say that there, there wasn't a ton of published information, especially from smaller cities about um, the metrics of their program. And I know this is not a direct comparison, but um, the city of Beaverton published a, a annual report and that included a measurement of success, which was how many families transitioned out of their car camping program into more permanent housing. Um, so yes, there, there was not a ton of uh, publishing of report, but as in our recommendation, we would recommend that the city of Newburgh keeps these kinds of metrics so they can, uh, you know, measure success in their own way. And then I can add on to that. So we did ask that question to a couple of different cities and service providers. Um, and again, not necessarily a direct comparison uh, city size wise to Newburgh, but the city of Bend, they do also collect the number of um, individuals that transition into housing, but they, the way they kind of framed it was more that they are serving the number of people that need to be served. So they kind of have like this target of, we think we need X um, number of spaces for people. And that's one way that they look at it. Um, I also talked to Encompass CM Hill Valley that runs a program in McBinville. So not the city's measure of success, but kind of what they um, saw it as. And they set housing goals with people that are participating in the program, but they also set other goals. Like someone may have a goal to gain work or something like that. And so they look at it a little more quant qualitatively like how is that person progressing towards what that person's goal is? So that was kind of some of the feedback that we heard in general was that it can be difficult to quantitatively measure um, success. And so some of those like anecdotal qualitative stories um, are helpful in doing that as well. Okay, any other questions? If someone could grab, oh, go ahead, Mike. Just. Uh, one last question that I have is, in your study, was there any cities um, that started out with the program and it went sideways, so to speak, and they closed it down because it wasn't successful or they weren't reaching the goals that they had um, set up? And Anthony, were you going to ask? I was just going to say, not that I can recall. I know that, you know, as I mentioned, the um, city of Milwaukee did a kind of one, they did a, they established the program as temporary um, and, and, and didn't continue, but it wasn't uh, necessarily contributed or sorry, attributed to any specific behavior or result. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. 
Yeah. And I'll add on to that, that I also did not see any where that happened. Um, but I think notable also that there were a couple of cities that we encountered that are more similarly sized. Um, that to Newburgh, like, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the name, Roseburg, um, they have rules in place, but they haven't had anybody apply to be a site. And that's true also in um, Medford, I believe. So there's also kind of the opposite thing of putting the rules in place and then not having anybody come forward to host a site. All right, other questions, folks? All righty, well, um, to the project team, you know, thank you all. So Katie, Ryan, Mary, Scott, Anthony, and Paul, thank you all so very much. Um, and, you know, thank you as well to your professor, Professor Golub, I think if I didn't butcher his name too badly. Um, please, I hope you get a good grade, right? Uh, you know, if we get to weigh in, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll happily weigh in. But anyway, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, and we will go from here. Um, so thank you. Um, and again, um, thank you for bringing up a, you know, an issue that does affect even a city like Newburgh. So thank you very much. All right, if somebody could grab the lights behind you, that would be great. And then I have a little, I have a little participatory question for y'all, if you will indulge me for a second. All right, there's roughly 30-ish uh, people here. We've heard from a couple of people that have either themselves experienced homelessness or they know of people that have, or they've had people park on their space. What I'd like to ask all of you is, in this room, how many of you have known someone who's homeless, worked with somebody who's homeless, or been homeless yourself? Just show of hands, anybody. That's it. All right. Um, again, uh, you know, that's probably half the room, which again, so this is a problem that isn't just a problem in Portland, right? Obviously, it's a, port it's a problem in Redmond, apparently. Um, so this isn't just a, a big city problem, and I'm sure the folk from this Encompass Yam Hill Valley who are here with us this evening could tell us that. Um, the other couple of things, and we're, I know we're gonna have some public comment on this during the, the business session, but a couple of things I just wanted to point out that weren't necessary or might've been mentioned, but I'd like to highlight. This request and why this came to us was brought by faith-based organizations who see the need. That was the first reason this came about. The five-year housing plan included 49 items this was one of them. As I mentioned at the onset, there um, no money was paid to these fine students. This was a, a program through school. So the only investment we had on this, um, which I think is fairly minimal was staff time. All right. People are car camping now in Newburgh. All right, they mentioned that. These people have, are deeply connected with our community. They grew up here, work here, or they have children in the school district. Um, many of us actually know them and know their names, and you may too, that grew up here, whether it's Erlene or Michael or Lisa or Kenny, they grew up here. So this isn't an imported problem either. All right, the other thing, we've got a realtor, at least one realtor in the room. Since 2000, housing costs have grown at a rate four times higher than income growth in our fair city. Okay. Unfortunately, with things like inflation, rapidly rising interest rates, uh, hopefully the problem will not get worse. All right, another note that they made in here and was mentioned, I think we mentioned the children earlier. In the 2019-2020 school year, 239 students in grades K through 12 were considered homeless in Newburgh School District. 13 of those students, according to this report, were unsheltered completely, including living in vehicles. All right, um, car camping. The other thing that's been a fallacy, I think, out there in the, in the internet world is that this is a blanket approval for car camping throughout the city. I think as you clearly saw, this is not. This is a request from a service provider to provide it. I kind of tipped my hand earlier. There, there were churches that were doing this without being registered. Part of the problem is, to try, it, my opinion, part of the problem is, as mentioned, we would like to have some kind of regulation if the council moves forward on this. My personal opinion is that there absolutely needs to be on-site 
wraparound services continually to get people off the street, out of their cars and into something more permanent. If I sound a little bit uh, interested in this, and I think I can speak to other members of the council, I, I've worked in this line of work in a prior life, uh, housing homeless veterans on a, a former Air Force base. And it is the most vexing, tragic, terrible, complex problem that there is. And it's heartbreaking. So anyway, that having been said, anyone else, would you like, you've got anybody else for a minute or two, Denise? I just have a comment on, <clears throat> statistical comment. Um, we, at, at where I work, run a report every year. It's called Oregon by the Numbers. And it lists every single county and the issues every single county has. We rate number one. You have to have a $75,000 a year income in Yamhill County to cover just basic needs. We are the most expensive county in the entire state and if anybody wants that report i will gladly give it to you because we get them all we have plenty yeah the other thing i will say and, and at least one second is that you know again this is just a report tonight that's what it was as a report to us any action that the council take will be the subject i'm sure the planning commission planning commission city council it will be a series of process um, where we would obviously solicit public input so please please know that at least yeah, thank you. I just wanted to reiterate what similar to what Denise was saying and uh, Mayor Rogers is that um, oftentimes in this type of forum, people um, come to the conversation not actually knowing that there are organizations, faith based organizations, healthcare organizations that have been doing this for the last five years. And so um, I just want to also put out the good faith um, effort and um, remembering good intent of community members and organizations that there are incredible service providers in this community that we want to um, not fight against but partner with and a couple of them are in the room right now um, and so I hope I guess my statement is that I hope for a thoughtful process that we can work through together so that we don't have scenarios that get out of hand um, but that do honor the citizens that are in Newburgh um, that have grown up here and are struggling and we really it is it's our responsibility to support them yep um you know some of those service organizations just for i mentioned um encompass earlier ycap harvest house loving providence helping hand second street drop-in center all the church meal providers and the cooling and warming shelters and so there's just a couple so by that alone i think it defines that there is a need if, if we've got, you know, again, 32 churches in Newburgh, I think by last count, and folks are doing this every single week. So uh, they should be applauded for their efforts. All right, we good. Um, Stephanie, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say one of the things that I see and hear when I'm out in the community is uh, Newburgh's overwhelming pride in how they take care of their neighbors and how they take care of each other and how we are a small community that we know each other, we love each other, and we spend our resources on each other. And unless we are putting feet to the ground on issues like this, then we need to really think about why we take pride in that sort of service to our community. So I, I really, these people did a phenomenal job in presenting the whole wide array of things that can happen. And it is incumbent upon Newburgh as a community to decide what fits best for us. And coming to the table with solutions is how we come to that, not coming complaining about our neighbors who, um, have fallen on hard times, but coming to the table with with real world solutions to these issues is what's going to make us a community that we can continue to pride ourselves into taking care of each other. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. Jeff. Yeah. Just a comment. We we don't live on an island, and um, the impact that uh, that other communities make will definitely have a reflection on us. What Portland decides to do, what McMinnville decides to do, what Dundee is doing, all of those things impact us. And I think we need to be prepared um, to respond in the right way for if, if another community makes a change, it could it could seriously impact us. Yeah, and that's that's also, and just to follow on that a little bit, that's what, uh, Jefferson, that's why we have, um, you know, Yamhill County wide homeless um, task force that's working. There's in the mid Willamette Valley, uh, Polk and Marion County work together towards the issue because as we well know, it isn't, it isn't an isolated item. So, 
All right, anything else? Any other comments? Okay, Camellia Planning, thank you all very, very much. Um, you know, best of luck with, uh, you know, if you're not yet finished the school year, best of luck finishing it. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you're looking for a job, you know, Newburgh, sometimes you never know. Keep us in mind. All righty. Thank you all. Thanks very much. I'm going to close the work session and we'll open the business session in five minutes at 7.08. Hey, roll call, please, Sue. Uh, Mike McBride. Here. Jefferson Mildenberger. Uh, present. Elise Yarnell Holloman. Here. Rick Rogers. Present. Denise Bacon. Here. Uh, Stephanie Finley. Here. And uh, District 2 is vacant at the moment. Yes. All righty. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. All righty. Okay. All right. So the presentations item here on our agenda is item 4A. I am, th this is a proclamation that I am delighted to announce. So allow me to, to read this. And then hopefully I think we've got, is it Mika and Jessica? All right. All right. There's a proclamation declaring June 21st, 2022 as Newburgh, Oregon Battle of the Books Day in recognition of their achievements. Whereas the bibliophiles, Edwards Elementary Oregon Battle of the Books team has studied hard and read and reread the Oregon Battle of the Books titles and worked together as a team throughout the year. Whereas the team was comprised of five fifth grade girls from the dual language program, all competing together for the first time. Whereas the bibliophiles won the re original Oregon Battle of the Books competition for the third through fifth graders on April 23rd, 2022. Whereas the team went on to have the highest score of all third through fifth grade Oregon Battle of the Book teams in the entire state. Whereas the city of Newburgh would like to recognize the achievements of these students for their superior accomplishments. And now therefore it is by proclaimed by the mayor of the city of Newburgh, Oregon, that June 21st, 2022 is Newburgh, Oregon Battle of the Books Day. In the city of Newburgh, and we urge all residents of Newburgh, Newburgh to recognize, support and commend these students for their relentless commitments to greatness. Yay! Yay! All right. All right. We have a, I'll give them this one and we'll get you a more formal one. All right. I will take a picture before. Oh, a picture, yes. Yeah. Why don't you come on, counselors? This is Battle of the Books. Let's go. Let me take a picture. Yes. First wrestling, now this. All righty, and now fight item 4B. Um, and Leslie, you get to, to follow the presentation from the bibliophiles. This is now Taste Newberg quarter three report. Good evening, Leslie. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Rogers, council and staff. I am pleased to present Taste Newberg's January through March 2022 quarterly report, which seems like a really long time ago at this point. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So as I've mentioned before, our regular web updates include blog, blog articles, events listings, and fresh content to enhance our search engine optimization results. The results of that work reflect on this slide, which show that year-over-year -year website visitation has grown 768%, which is 281% of our annual goal. For the quarter, we had close to 28,000 unique visitors to our website, up 8% compared to the prior quarter. 
Page views totaled 46,000, reflecting a 481% increase year over year, and it's up 23% compared to last quarter. This represents 224% of our annual goal. While average time on site decreased by 21% year to date, we believe this is due to ad campaign volume, which will include many visitors who enter and exit the site quickly. This metric gives us reason to tweak our target audiences, as well as ensure that we're reflecting relevant content on the entry page of our website. So this is something we will continue to work towards performance improvement with this particular metric. So our outbound referrals to industry partner businesses were 5,401, reflecting 279% of our annual goal. This was up 262% compared to prior quarter. Next slide, please. So we wrote and published four blog articles in the quarter, focusing on Valentine's Day, Newburgh Truffle Month, why wine enthusiasts should visit the Willamette Valley, <clears throat> excuse me, and top weekend trip ideas near Portland. We supported 35 industry partner businesses through these articles, as well as linked to all of our lodging partners. Total blog views were 3,296. We promoted Newburgh Truffle Month in February through our various marketing channels, as well as Women's History Month in March. Our photo capture work included January snowfall in Newburgh, Truffle hunting with black tie tours and spring blooms and new bird. Next slide, please. So our social media results reflect follower growth of 87% year over year on Facebook and 94% on Instagram. Instagram continues to have more followers than Facebook by about 2x, while engagements are stronger on Facebook. Our Facebook reach and engagement are down compared to last quarter, which we believe are a result of some tracking changes that Meta has implemented for Facebook. I've heard similar reports from other industry partners with their reach and engagement statistics over this same time frame. So we'll continue to dig into this and see how we can make that improvement. Um, we have achieved 111% of our annual goal for Facebook followers, and our reach is at 186% of annual goal and up 138% year over year. Next slide, please. So for Instagram, we've already achieved 144% of our annual goal and it is up 94% year over year. Engagement is at 94% of annual goal and up 130% year over year. Reach has far exceeded our annual target of 427% of annual goal and up 250% compared to last year. Next slide, please. So three of our top five performing Facebook posts were about our Women's History Month campaign, which highlighted the various female faces of our industry partners in Newburgh. <clears throat> Other top posts were about locally owned pizza places in Newburgh, which continually gets high rankings on the social feeds anytime we talk about pizza or beer. And Coin Six's interview of Subterra owner Javier Santos and his chef for a Foodie Friday segment. Next slide, please. So three of our top Instagram posts were about Women's History Month as well. The others in the top five were the pizza story, as well as Miss Hannah's truffle infused popcorn for Newburgh Truffle Month. Next slide, please. We sent consumer newsletters out monthly, highlighting our seasonal and culinary promotions, as well as our earned media coverage, new business openings, and events around town. We also sent newsletters to tourism industry partners, including information about our Newburgh Truffle Month culinary promotion educational and grant opportunities, as well as Newburgh specific events, you know, earned media coverage stories and new business information that they can share with their customers. We are pleased with the 45 to 52% open rate and eight to 10% click rate, which exceeds the industry norm and confirms that our content is relevant. So for the quarter, our top performing clicks showed a mix of interests and topics as recapped on the slide. Next slide, please. So Taste Newberg's public relations efforts for the quarter resulted in 16 articles, 138 million impressions, and mention of 67 industry partner businesses. In partnership with Willamette Valley Visitors Association, their PR efforts generated another two articles, 64,000 impressions, and three Newberg business mentions. We hosted two media visits during the quarter. Next slide, please. 
So during the quarter, our PR team focused on the Newburgh Truffle Month promotion, as well as various media pitches, resulting in three feature stories on Coin6, articles in United Airlines in-flight magazine, and on Willamette Valley Visitors Association's website blog and e-newsletter. Truffle Month lodging package that we put together at the Allison generated 14 bookings for $9,000 in lodging revenue. Black Tide Tours sold out all of their truffle hunt tours, even after adding extra tours to accommodate the demand. We hosted two media visits throughout the quarter with stories already published. Next slide, please. And this picture in the background from Teeter Totter, by the way. Um, so our Earth media coverage for the quarter included 18 articles mentioning Newburgh places, people, or happenings, including weekend getaway to Newburgh in Oregon wine country, Willamette in winter, truffle hunts and forest feasts in Willamette Valley wine country, all by national publications, and Newburgh has great places to stay and eat by Jerry Frank on OregonLive.com. Point six media segments included Foodie Friday, as I mentioned previously, Poor Explorers Newburgh Truffle Month, and Wine Wednesday featuring the Clue Bay Stroll at the Allison. A total of 70 Newburgh businesses were mentioned throughout these stories. Next slide, please. So we actively engage with our state and regional destination marketing organization teams through participation in Travel Oregon's Governor's Conference on Tourism, Oregon Destination Association's annual conference, which gathers all of the DMOs from the state. Uh, we hosted Willamette Valley Visitors Association staff for familiarization visits in January and February. We attended Willamette Valley Wineries Association annual meeting. We hosted chamber greeters in February, showcasing the Truffle Month activities and participating businesses. And they, we had, uh, Subterra was made some amazingly delicious truffle ice cream. Next slide, please. So Taste Newburgh, the Chamber and the Downtown Coalition presented an ARPA fund request to City of Newburgh, specific to local business marketing support. Our funding request was approved. Thank you, Council and Committee. As part of the funding, we co-hosted with Newburgh Downtown Coalition a Maximize Your Google Business Profile Seminar in March for local businesses. And hopefully we will put on another one of those in probably early fall. We participated on said an advisory committee work session to make recommendations to Yamho County commissioners for ARPA funding specific to hospitality needs such as workforce development and local supply chain shortages. Um, we continued our participation with Visit McMinnville for Travel Oregon's destination ready assessment of Yamho County outdoor recreation gaps with a particular lens on cycling and mountain biking. This work will begin in 2022 once funding sources have been identified and it will continue through 2024. Next slide, please. So this chart tracks net city of Newburgh receipts for lodging tax revenue per quarter. I'm pleased to report the January to March 2022 receipts were $173,000, which is up 59% compared to 2021 and 99.4% of 2019, which was record revenue for Newburgh. So the Allison's labor shortages continued for this quarter, which resulted in hotel closures on Monday and Tuesday nights. Despite this, they represented 57% of total TLT revenue for the quarter. Vacation and rental demand was strong also. So both the Allison and Lifestyle Property Management, who are key contributors to TLT receipts, report strong demand in 2022. Traveler sentiment has been positive. Consumers are traveling both by car and air and a busy summer season is anticipated. Next slide, please. So for the budget, Taste Newburgh's total revenue in the third fiscal quarter was $64,000, reflecting TLT paid from October to December's quarter. As a reminder, our quarterly revenues are always a quarter behind the cities due to when we get paid by the city. So total expenses for the quarter were $96,000. Our most ex significant expense line items in the quarter were for advertising, marketing, public relations, and payroll. Our expenses exceeded revenue as we were busy catching up to the lost years of COVID with our brand campaigns and other marketing specific work. Next slide, please. So please be sure to support the businesses that are on the Newburgh Lavender Trail throughout the month of July 
You can find the details on newburghlavendertrail.com. I'm pleased to let you know that Newburgh was again named in the top 10 of USA Today's 10 best for small town food scenes for 2022, moving up from last year's ranking of number six to number four and leading three West Coast cities in Oregon, California, and Washington. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to address any questions you might have, but first, I would like to officially announce my retirement from Taste Newburgh, hopefully you've all heard that by now, which is effective in July. Replacing me will be Lee Jensen, who most recently served as Chief Operations Officer at Visit to Temecula Valley, which is Southern California's wine country. So we were fortunate that she and her husband were already planning a move to Oregon to be closer to family. And I will just tell you, Temecula Valley is a wine plus spirited destination inspired by the vine with several distinct pillars, which is Southern California wine country, outdoor recreation and entertainment, small town atmosphere, an emerging and evolving culinary scene and its community of makers. Our board felt that this mirrored Newburgh's pillars perfectly. And we are excited to have for Lee to amplify the work that Taste Newburgh has done and has accomplished these past three years in building a solid platform from which to grow. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Lee. All right, questions, folks? Uh, Leslie, I'll, I'll just say this for myself. I, um, you started with nothing, <laughs> right? This destination marketing organization was zero when you started. And That's true. Now, yeah, right. And now we and and then you went through COVID, <laughs> and we were trying to get people in hotels so we could raise transient lodging tax. But thank you, thank you for all that you've done. Um, in many ways, you actually put us on the map. Look at it this way, you know, restaurant scene, small town restaurant scene. What do you? Who knew? Right there, you go. So I can't thank you enough. Best of everything in retirement, well deserved, and and enjoy. But don't be a stranger, right? We want you to come here and stay in our hotels and pay logic tax. <laughs> oh, I like it. All right. Well, thank you so much. It has been my pleasure. And, and I promised that I would be available through, through the transition with Lee. So I won't be a stranger. I promised we'll worry that. <laughs> so ah, there, there, you go. Go. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Anybody else? Me, thank me, you. Me. Yeah. Okay. I have to just say to Leslie, um, you've been a real friend of mine. I really appreciate your um the relationship that you have sought out with myself, but every counselor. And um, when you joined um, <laughs> Taste Newburgh, I, I mean, for those of you that, for us that were around, it was a little uh, tense at that time um, about TLT and chamber. And um, you've just been such a good partner. And I feel like have really created relationship between the chamber and downtown coalition and Taste Newburgh. And you're everything that I would hope for leadership in this community. So you better still stay around and have lunch with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anything else? Leslie, I think just. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, let's see. Moving along. Are we on city manager's report? Mr. We are. Worthy. We are. The statistics are grand. Okay. So as you know, knowledge is power. And as we continue to accumulate information about what the city does, we know that trend lines will emerge, particularly when we get to the first 12 months in the can. New slide, please. On the front of planning, there were 20 combined planning decisions of all sorts. And there were 14 building permits issued for units and ADUs. New slide, please. Building permits of other sorts, there were 98 issued, and there was a whopping 610 building inspections carried out. New slide, please. In community engagement, there were 14 forms submitted with questions to the, to the city. And for social media engagements, there was 12,405 of those. And that's with just one staff member. New slide, please. That same staff member handled social media followers. There were 12,000, 3,716 Facebook, 
403 Twitter and 240 LinkedIn. New slide, please. And over to finance. There was 1.47 million of payments made to accounts payable. And remember, of course, folks, these are payments made in a manual system where every check has to be stamped by hand. Not for, not for long, Katie. And there was $0.86 million of payroll processed. In HR activity, there were two recruitments advertised, two hires, zero separations, and two claims of all sorts. And I must add, this is a bit less activity than normal because we did let Alison Seiler go on vacation. <laughs> New slide, please. During the period, the IT department resolved 145 service tickets and had to res respond to six of those events after hours so as to keep the servers running, etc. New slide, please. In library activity, we had 6,641 visitors and we had circulation events of 22 1,564, and I will point out that prior to the pandemic, the number was closer to 30,000, so we're still recovering from that point in time. New slide, please. Over on to public safety, we had 812 calls to 911, and we had 3,088 non-emergency calls to that section. New slide, please. In other public safety statistics, we had 2,061 calls for service. We had 437 traffic stops, and we generated 389 citations and warnings to people of all sorts doing various things. New slide, please. And sadly, we had 15 DUIIs during the period. New slide, please. Public Works completed a, an incredible 8,292 work orders. And each work order represented somebody cleaning out a drain, unblocking something, fixing a pothole, whatever it may be. New slide, please. Water production. Now, this is interesting because water production is currently running to a very similar number that you would expect in the winter time because of all this rain that we've had. So we haven't seen the usual ramping up of water production. Currently, 53.8 million gallons for the period. And on the other side of the ledger, 125.85 million gallons treated. New slide, please. So that is our statistics for this month. As more months go by and the data continues to come in, soon we will have some yearly metrics to bench our numbers against. And are there any questions? Uh, the public works numbers rising so much, that's a cyclical thing for the weather improving, I assume? Part of that is indeed, because there are many things that work better in the drier weather, such as it has been. And so, <laughs> We go over to a summer schedule, which is a four tens to concentrate crews on maintenance work in the summertime, and that causes a spike in tickets answered. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Will, on the library uh, circulation events, 22,564. Explain to me, what is a circulation event? What yep. does that mean? So approximately... 60, my goodness, you asked the right man. I know all about this. So <laughs> approximately 60% of those circulation events are what is called first time checkouts. So that means you've taken a DVD or a book or even a digital checkout and it's checked out for the first time. The remaining 40% is when somebody has renewed something. So we call that events rather than having a long sentence. All right, other questions? I have one actually. Um, with the permitting, can ADUs be broken out? Would that be easy to do? I just be, I just be curious to know. 
Um, yes. Okay. They can, they can be broken Without, out. As long as it's not too much trouble, I'd just be curious to know how many we're approving. Okay. Thank you. I will start to break them out effective next report. Sounds great. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Anything else? All righty. All right. We've now moved on to the portion of the evening for public comments. These are general public comments, not specific to an item necessarily on the agenda. And with this, we will start with Mr. Bill Rossiker. And this was on the subject of car camping. Is this show and tell? What do you, what do you? Well, for those of you who don't know, car camping and top ramen are equated, they equate each other to me. Top ramen is what we Christians give to people that need food when we want to feel really good about giving people food without spending any money. That's what car camping is to help the homeless people. I first became aware of the car camping issue in November when Mayor Rogers at a, at a city council meeting asked a question, what's car camping? I thought, well, that's odd. So I researched and I went back and I found on the uh, five-year plan that there was one mention of car camping. It was actually about middle housing and, and so forth, which is what, what it was called at the time. One mention of car camping and uh, looked at the agenda and in April, there was a meeting with the Affordable Housing Commission. By the way, the Affordable Housing Commission has a fund for uh, affordable housing, which by the end of this year, a Doug isn't here, I believe he said was going to be at half a million dollars. It's a lot of money. Um, you guys hired a company to perform what you call in your document the car cam camping initiative. The company that you hired, Camellia Planning, which I believe should be renamed Rosie Planning, because that report that I just read today, and by the way, I've only read the first 90 pages of the 150 page report, is the most rosy uh, description of car camping that a person could possibly give. We are doing all of this, according to their report, because there are nine homeless people in Newburgh, nine. Now you've heard her state nine to 20, but if you read a report, the number she can verify is nine. But of course that doesn't match her agenda, so it's nine to 20. Here's an interesting statistic, $6,500. This comes from the city of McMinnville, one of the city councilors who I talked to about their car camping program. This is what it costs to remove one RV from City Street. City of McMinnville has no money in their budget to remove car camping or to remove these. So the word is up. City of McMinnville is not towing RVs. So therefore, they're moving there in, in mass and they're living in them again. What the city asked the Camellia Planning, Rosie Planning, to do was create a land use system where people could apply for the right to camp, to have car camping on their property. It's not necessary. The law currently allows you, the citizen, me, the citizen, to have as many people as I am responsible, want to be responsible for, as long as they're on my property and following the current laws. Um, a church, according to state law, can have three cars on their property. They don't need the city's permission. City planning doesn't need to be involved in this thing. Jane Doe, I was glad they brought that up on, the, uh, on their presentation today. That is the only factual encounter, according to their plan, with Jane Doe. Now, if you remember right, Jane Doe was a single mother, had four children. Uh, what they didn't mention is that she uh, was homeless because her, she lived with her <coughs> brother, and her brother died. So she went to the various stakeholders in Newburgh with her problem. And shame on them. Not a single one of them was willing to help them, her words, or the words in, in the report. She felt uh, alienated by the uh, people 
and she ended up choosing to live in her car. Great, four kids in her car. That's the best we can do. I mentioned before that the Affordable Housing Commission has a million dollars. By the way, you gave $70,000 to the fair, or the new hotel that's coming into town. Maybe we can get vouchers from them for some of these, these homeless people. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I forgot to talk to it. Oh, the other problem, no citizen involvement in this entire process. This, this is the second time I've spoke at public meetings. There have been two public meetings. It has to be this. I get five minutes to come up here and do this. And then I go sit down and you guys carry on business without my input or anybody else's input. There is not going to be sufficient input on this issue. The city intends to cram this down our throat. And I promise I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that it doesn't happen. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Lee Eubanks, please. Okay, my name's Lee Eubanks. I'm a 60-plus uh, year uh, veteran of Newburgh. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes over the years, some good, some not so good. This one, I think, is the latter. Uh, to begin with, what I don't understand is that car camping is already tolerated in the city of Newburgh. Um, I see no reason to expand it. Uh, the problem I have with it is that over the last five to seven years, I've dealt with just untold amounts of people trying to camp on my street, doing drugs on my street, uh, filling up two vacant houses very near me. Uh, I had the police on speed dial. The chief probably doesn't even want to talk to me. <laughs> but a lot of those calls were service were mine. Uh, in that time, unfortunately, with the multitude of people that I dealt with, there were only two that were actually down on their luck due to circumstances beyond their control. Uh, the rest of them have absolutely no uh, use for your personal property as far as, well, respect for your personal property. Uh, I've garbage thrown in the street, needles thrown in the street. You go out and confront them about it and you're some kind of an idiot. They have every right to be there. Uh, that kind of attitude just isn't necessary. Then we get to the point of, you know, people, a lot of people are coming here from McMinnville, Tigard. They're using services that people who are down on their luck in the city of Newburgh could use. In one instance, a bunch of people coming from Mac to use the homeless shelter here. <clears throat> I know a person who interviewed two of them. Their purpose for coming here is that they're not held to the standards. Here they are in Mac's homeless facility. They don't have to pass a UA. They can come in high, drunk, doesn't matter. Well, in that case, uh, one of Newberg's uh, people who's had a, a drug problem, alcohol problem for years, Michael Barrera, couldn't get in, went out, ended up laying in a parking strip, a triangle across from David's OK Market out there and sleeping there where he was run over by a car ended up in OHSU with multiple broken bones, internal injuries. Uh, I just, uh, <clears throat> from my point of view, law enforcement's hands are tied so badly anymore with laws. Uh, they've, they've legalized the use of some bad, bad drugs. I think they're driving 90% of the mental issues <clears throat> that they have to deal with. We don't have facilities for those people. Uh, their only recourse is to take them and monitor them at the hospital for eight hours and then turn them loose where they can abuse hospital staff, police officers. You're tying up a police officer acting as a babysitter uh, for those individuals. And I just don't, don't see any need to elevate it to make it any worse than it is. I know what it will do in the city of McMinnville over by the DMV. They've turned that strip along the from the DMV past the park there into an absolute crap hole. There's garbage thrown all over the place. There are garbage cans within 20 paces of those vehicles, and they'll throw it out the window of their car and won't walk over to put it in. There was a mattress laying over there that had been rained on for probably two weeks. Uh, somebody just threw out there. That's all on the city to pick up all that. So it's definitely an issue, and I don't see any reason to make it 
any worse than it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Mara, Rob Molza, please. Hello, I'm Rob Molzon. I'm a, the, the local realtor in the room. <laughs> um, and it's always difficult to be opposed to something because it makes you sound like you're uncompassionate. But uh, I appreciate the comments you made earlier. Um, I've encountered a few times where car camping has been prevalent in, in Newburgh. Uh, my office is located at 2501 Portland Road. And um, some of you may have remembered it as the sweetest things cupcakes. Um, we have a parking lot behind the building that's surrounded by three sides that kind of keeps it hidden from Elliott Road or from uh, 99. I was managing the office at the time and I came into the lot uh, early one morning and found the car loaded clear to the hilt with just stuff and someone sleeping in the driver's seat. This was not authorized, uh, but they found the spot. I went and knocked on the window and asked them to move. They grumbled a bit and turned, then turned away. I said I would call, call the police and within 10 minutes they pulled out of the lot. Also, across the street from us is uh, the Panda Express and Starbucks. Those are the two busy um, businesses in that plaza. And up in the north corner, um, there's a spot that's kind of hidden by the fences. And there was a car there for probably well over a week. Um, I called the owner of the, the property and uh, brought their attention to it. We called the police and it took four police cars surrounding the area to get them to leave because they got belligerent. Um, a third instance, um, Thursday mornings, our Rotary Club met over at the Cultural Center. And on Sherman Street, there was a car that uh, every, several several weeks in a row, they were sitting there and I, I thought that these two guys were dead actually in the car. They had their seats laid back, but the, steam, the windows were all steamed up so I knew they were breathing. Um, but they had to be asked to be move on. And then lastly, I'm an owner of a, of a building downtown and we, we had a what we thought was an abandoned car in the parking lot because um, they would leave early in the morning and wander around town or get into our bathroom somehow and use the bathroom. But we finally got them out of the parking lot. I think um, whether it's in a residential area, a parking lot of a, of a business, it's scary to know what they're there for. It's scary to confront them and ask them to move on because they become belligerent and unfriendly. I understand there are circumstances where there's families that in need fall into hard, hard times and that for that I have compassion. Um, you may think that having certain locations in this area will approve and make it easy to manage, but uh, would it be safe? Um, it becomes messy. Sometimes the garbage is left outside the car. It becomes an eyesore. It's scary to residents and clients. Um, I strongly urge you to explore this uh, topic before deciding on it. I recognize that allowing car camping um, without controls can get out of control. It's not good for the community and it's not good for commerce. We can be compassionate and serve in other ways. Allowing car camping is not compassionate. It's, it's, it, to me, it's foolish and opens the door to getting out of control. Uh, before implementing, I would really support or suggest that you explore the impact and opinions of the general public in the other communities that have been allowing for car camping, not just reports and other council reports. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Timothy Bruner, please. Good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, my name is Tim Bruner. Um, I moved to Newburgh one year ago. Uh, my daughter attended uh, George Fox University and we just fell in love with Newburgh immediately. Um, we moved here because our community in East Portland, West Gresham became unlivable. Um, I couldn't allow my boys to walk in the neighborhood because of the car campers. The drug paraphernalia and garbage left when people move on made it extremely unsafe for my kids. We came to Newburgh because it seemed to value its livability for the community. We've invested much of our time and resources in this community over this last year and we plan to continue to do that. We just love it here. Um, as the city council prepares to discuss the study, study further, I hope you consider even one example where car camping overall has made a community better. Also, please consider if you truly believe car camping is even a temporary form of housing. The 
there's no bed. I have several family members in law enforcement in the metro area, and I've talked with local law enforcement officers. They've all stated car camping has created far more problems for communities than any possible positive attributes. It was stated tonight that Beaverton police said there was no noticeable increase in crime due to car camping. I think this should be dove into more, and I seriously question this. It might be they do not track that statistic and really do not know. Please explain, because my experience has been much different. There are some individuals that have legitimate reasons and or circumstances that have put them into the situation of car camping. Jane's example tonight certainly pulls at heartstrings. I do not completely understand Jane's personal situation other than what was said tonight. A picture of car camping has been painted of the individual that car camping of car camping with this example. However, she is not the only example of the car camping population. My experience has been most individuals that do not want to go into temporary housing because they don't want to live by the rules. I own an office building in East Portland over the past three to four years. I have personally talked with 12 people that car camped on the property. Of those 12, only one had a legitimate example, being it was between jobs and did not appear to be addicted while I was talking to him. The rest of the car campers were usually strung out on math or other addictions, and many were in need of mental health support. That's a whole other topic that I won't get into now, but we've failed as a state for decades. I hope you understand prior to judging my position that I truly love these people. My heart goes out to them. Again, it's difficult to understand each and every personal situation. We cannot forget though that many people that car camp end up taking advantage of the rules. Crime, garbage, drug paraphernalia, safety, all that make a community less livable for the rest of the community that does not work, that does work hard to make ends meet every day to stay in their current housing. Car camping makes a community less livable for everyone. It is really sad to even think that car camping is an acceptable form of temporary housing. It's hard to believe we're even discussing this as being acceptable tonight. We should be above this. If the city wants to do something really helpful, focus on economic development, training, and jobs. I know you think that, well, what about in the interim? And this is a complicated issue, but car camping should not be considered an option. It does not make the community better. Car camping is not a form of housing. Many people take advantage once they're given a little latitude. Some people are local, however, many are transitory. They go to where the path of least resistance is. If this city council considers this, you are setting up the community for failure. Regulation will be expensive and difficult. Costs will continue to grow year after year and livability for the community will get worse and worse. Once the city council opens this door, it will spiral out of control and is almost impossible to retract. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Welcome to the community. All right, uh, let's see. Mike, uh, Mike Gunn, please. Yes. My name is Mike Gunn. I don't think it comes as any surprise to the city council and the mayor that I've been here before you over the last eight years, pretty critical of the way this city has been run, operated by the city managers, dating back to Jackie Betts. Uh, the, uh, apathy or however you want to put it of the city managers as far as not making any employees accountable for their actions that have cost the city hundreds of thousands of dollars and tactfully the city council has been the same way now i'm here tonight because you know i've been representing leonard johnson and bowers on these problems that we've had leonard's trying to get a 950 square foot plus or minus storage building to replace one that's 600 and some square feet. He's been dealing with the city for about a year and a half. Uh, politically correct saying uh, the city has been less than cooperative as far as trying to help him get that built up until the last six weeks. I will uh, give some accolades in a minute here. Uh, Bowers, uh, same way, although I think we have that pretty much resolved. What I'm saying is that the mantra from the city standpoint certainly does not conform with the mission statement as far as being servants of the public, trying to, you know, provide good service to the public, et cetera. Uh, 
It's been, unfortunately, it's been pretty much the opposite of that. However, I will say that I know Mayor Rogers asked Doug Rux here a couple months ago when we were dealing with Bauer's situation when the city authorized initiation of the vacations, do you have Leonard's squared away? And he said, yes, it's been approved from a design review standpoint and a variance standpoint. It's now in the building permit uh, you know, approval stage. We got approval of the building permit, albeit a month after we submitted it, uh, about the middle of May. Uh, there was a problem with the location of the property line. That was resolved. We had to submit revised drawings. Uh, at any rate, those have been approved without with some problems, say problems with the city. Uh, we now have an approval on revised drawings. I will say that this delay, and there's plenty of blame to go all around all the way. Part of it is our fault, but there's plenty for the city standpoint, has cost Leonard about $15,000 in increased price of lumber from what he bid it at, you know, 15 months ago to what it is now. But at any rate, let's pull all of that beside us for, for a minute here. I want to say that Mayor Worthy, or Mayor Worthy, I'm sorry, City Manager Worthy, City, city Manager Worthy has been the only city manager in the last eight years that has actually gone out of his way to help somebody, okay? Now, David Klein, who, uh, let's say he and I didn't agree on very much at all, met with me one time. I think it was basically window dressing to check the box. That was a very short meeting when he told me I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. That's really not the way to get started. Will, if I may say Will, has been the city manager or the city has done a great job in hiring him, put it this way. I'm not trying to suck up to him or anything. He's been the only city manager that has actually shown concern for this, what, what an average citizen has to go through to try to get something approved by the city, okay? And it's not been easy. He, went, he came down there last week, met with Leonard and me. We showed him what we had to deal with with the city. It shouldn't have been as difficult as it's been. He went out of his way. He called me out of the blue about six weeks ago. Never talked to him a day in my life. And, and I will say that he is really trying to get this city squared away, making people accountable for what they've done from an employee standpoint and trying to have customer service as paramount. So I want to say accolades to him on that. Now, I I've got 35 seconds left. I've got this, this situation with the homeless, the, the car camping. Uh, I read all of that two months ago when, when it first came out. And I'm not trying to be disingenuous. These people that made the presentation tonight, uh, politically correct, are a bunch of academicians, okay? They don't know what the real world is. There are many unintended consequences that they haven't taken into account. And that's something that needs to be greatly explored before you approve anything like that. So with that, oh. I want, may I say one other thing? You've got a consent agenda item about Leonard before you. Normally, people don't comment on that, and there's no debate on it. You know, I, I will say I believe it's a fair resolution of the matter. I don't know if you're going to debate it, et cetera. I would hope you would pass that consent agenda. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. All righty. Uh, let's see. Speaking of which, nice. Uh, oh, Miss, actually, Jesse Cad in your packet also has comments. Did you want to say anything, Jesse, or just what's in there? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, let's let's move on. Nice segue, uh, Mike, on to the consent calendar. And here we are. As mentioned earlier, I will recuse myself, but I will entertain a motion. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent calendar. Second. And Stephanie with a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the consent calendar passes. All righty. All right. We're now on to continued business. And this one. All right. Continued business. Ordinance number 2022-2897, an ordinance amending New Newburgh Municipal Code, Title 15 Development Code, related to portable and temporary signs. All righty. Uh, James, is this you? 
I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to the city manager. Um, I guess we can start if there's any sort of declaration of conflicts of interest prior to the legislative hearing. Conflicts, anyone? Nope. All righty. Honorable Mayor and Councillors, the code change you have before you has been on a long journey. And during that journey, your city manager has explained the simple objective of this change to all sorts of folks in town. I've discussed this with regular residents, county residents, and even an unexpected call from the state representative. During these discussions, I've been able to explain to folks, mostly to their satisfaction, that this proposed change is simply to reduce the burden on the city during electoral periods and keep city staff out of party politics. Many residents have said that they would like to see the city not be involved in politics of that sort, and I agree. The goal of this change that, that I feel that everyone can get behind will enhance everybody's First Amendment rights by allowing them to have two flags or two signs to be displayed with no regard to election timing or anything else, so long as those are legal signs or flags. The sign code provision against flashing lights, gigantic signs, and other safety issues has not been modified. The only change is the removal of the electoral provision. And as I've said before, perhaps in jest, if somebody desires to have a sign that says, I like Ike, who am I to complain or question that sign? And I call that freedom of expression. Staff recommends approving the measure and by doing so, keeping city code enforcement staff free from political battles now and in the years to come. Staff recommends making this change. All righty, uh, let's start with uh, public testimony. I understand we have Mr. Robert Suppy on the line. Robert, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? We can, you've got five minutes. Wonderful. I want to start by quickly go, going over the written testimony that I provided for, for tonight. My hope is to clear up some misunderstandings about what is actually in the sign code. The first page that I submitted attempts to clarify what is and is not a flag based on the code. The first image I provided is a very typical sort of yard sign. Most of us would call it a flag, but it is not in terms of the sign code. Clearly, old glory is not necessarily a flag. The code's definition of a flag is strictly about its construction and has nothing to do with its content, consistent with the state and U.S. constitutions. At the last council meeting, there was a comment about the issue I raised regarding my being allowed to have unlimited signs in my front yard. I want to be clear that even with the changes recommended to you tonight, I'll continue to be allowed to have as many of these signs as I can pack in one, of, one yard as long as they're at least 10 feet from the property line. I have no specific objection to that, but I want to make sure the council understands that this hasn't been addressed. I also tried to clarify the proper definition of a portable sign. It need not be temporary. The code allows me to place an A-frame sign, the typical portable sign, in my front yard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I would consider that to be permanent and not temporary. Next, I want the council to be clear on the fact that you are being asked to increase the limit on the number of signs from one to two in three different instances. The first has to do with flags. I don't have any issue with allowing two flags on a property. I would like to note that on over 30 days of the year, an unlimited number of flags are already allowed. The second increase has to do with portable signs on property other than downtown. It seems reasonable enough to me to allow two signs in this case, especially since the proposal before you includes a reduction from the three signs that are presently allowed during the three month period before an election. The third instance has to do with the portable signs that are common on the sidewalk, sidewalks of downtown Newburgh. At present, there is generally just one allowed on each frontage. The pro proposal before you doubles that to allowing two on each frontage. I ask you to consider this change very carefully. When you walk around downtown, does it really strike you that there aren't enough portable signs? 
Personally, I find the sidewalks too cluttered already. I think that more portable signs on our downtown sidewalks will negatively impact the pedestrian-friendly nature of the area, as well as detracting further from the historic character. I encourage the council to accept the first two increases, but to not allow additional portable signs downtown. And I'm sorry about the phone, it'll, it'll stop. Lastly, I want to respond to a comment from the last meeting about how this was a surgical revision to the existing code and not an overhaul of it. While I won't disagree with that, I think it needs to be understood that this is how Newberg has done revisions to the sign code for quite a while. The last revision was done in 2015, and it too was initially intended to be very limited in focus. It was only because a staff member agreed with public input about other changes that needed to be made and encouraged the Planning Commission to include those changes. For example, prior to that, Residents have been prohibited from putting signs in the planter strip in front of their houses. Think of the common for sale, garage sale, or campaign sign. The mayor wouldn't have been allowed to put it to place a campaign sign in the planter strip in front of his house. If an opponent put their sign in the mayor's planter strip, the mayor didn't have the authority to remove it. Fortunately, the 2015 revision corrected that. But it's only because the staff member encouraged going beyond the very narrow focus of the revision and used it as an opportunity to correct some of the sign code shortcomings. I'm disappointed that the Planning Commission chose to maintain the narrow focus of this revision by disregarding some of the other changes that could easily have been made. I should note that the issue I raised about downtown signs for events, such as the Old Fashioned Festival or October Fest, being allowed for a very limited set of hours, has been brought to staff's attention numerous times over the last seven years. It disappoints me that it hasn't been addressed in that time, especially since a specific fix for it has been suggested and could easily have been implemented during the current sign code revisions. It concerns me greatly that the solution we continue to use is to just ignore the code rather than to apply a very simple fix. Thank you for your consideration of my comment. Thank you, Mr. Suppy. All righty, any other public comments, Sue? Nope. All right. I will close the public comment portion of this and now a recommendation from staff, Mr. Worthy. Staff recommends that you approve this surgical change to the current sign code. All right. Any questions of staff, folks? All right. Yes. I, I do have a question because I am concerned about ADA accessibility on sidewalks if there is an increase. And is there anything in the language that allows for us to figure that out? I mean, I, I guess my question is, if it becomes an issue, are we, are we hamstrung and not able to address ADA concerns on sidewalks if it falls within this code? Thank you. So looking at this issue and also in some dialogue, including with Mr. Suppy, we had explained that, of course, the city is open to further refinements to the sign code if they seem necessary. Staff's opinion really is that we don't think our business frontages in downtown will add two A-frames to the front of their very narrow frontages for their own business reasons. However, if this does start to turn out to be a problem, then staff will welcome another opportunity to revise that section of the code again, which we certainly could. Other questions, folks? Uh, let's see. Um, all right, James, anything else? What, um, are we ready for a motion? Or are we ready for it to? Sure, so just because it's an ordinance, I can read the, uh, the, Thank you. the, the title of the, um, of the ordinance. So, in front of the council is ordinance number 2022-2897, an ordinance amending Newburgh Municipal Code, Title 15 Development Code, Section 15.435.030, 15.435.090, and 15.435.100 related to portable and temporary signs. And the council um, in front of the council, the option in front of the council is to adopt this. You can have it read by title only. Um, this is the second time before the council, so no need to waive the uh, second reading. All righty, folks, are you ready to make a motion? And feel free to do by title only if you are so inclined. Sure. 
I move that we um, accept this um, ordin ordinance 2022-2897 uh, read by title only. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Mr. Mayor, it's an ordinance. Ordinance, sorry, roll ordinance. Call uh, roll call vote, please. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Finley. Aye. Uh, Councillor, um, sorry. Jarnell Holloman. Yes. Uh, Councillor Mildenberger. Yes. Uh, Councillor McBride. Yes. Mayor Rogers. Yes. Uh, Councillor Bacon. Yes. All righty, the, that passes. Let's move on to the next item on our agenda. This is now the public hearing. This is public hearing 9A RCA 3832 supplemental budget. Good evening, Katie. Good evening. You tired of budgets yet? <laughs> Never. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think there's some good news in there. Is it in this in there? Isn't there some good news in this? Maybe. No? Yeah, there's a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not all bad. Okay, next slide, Sue. All right, so in this second supplemental budget for the year, um, there's only a total increase to the budget of 400,000, and that is because we're anticipating additional TLT revenue in quarter four. So that is the good news. Um, and then the rest of it, um, that doesn't actually change the total amount of the budget, but we changed just the appropriation category. So some will decrease and some will increase. And then I'll go over those. Next slide, Sue. Oh, sorry. Oh. This public hearing is now called to order. A declaration of conflict of interest or abstentions, anyone? Hearing none, the staff report. <laughs> sorry, I skipped ahead there. <laughs> okay, so the general fund. Um, it looks like last year, um, poor Zyra wasn't included in the budget. So she's partially funded out of municipal court and then also in um, Sue's budget and city recorder. So that's why there's an increase of 25,000 to municipal court. The library is increasing by 50,000 because um, while Will was serving as the pro tem, the library increased hours for two employees and then we added a five hour on call um, in position or whatever. So. It was just kind of to help out the library while Will was on loan. And then that offset came out of the contingency for 75,000. Next slide. And then uh, fund 31, the fun one. So generally um, you wanna take the changes out of contingency, but we essentially used all of that up on earlier in the year for various reasons. So luckily um, the fund is overall will be okay. We just have to move from other departments budgets, which we don't generally like to do, but in this case, we kind of need to, to make everything whole. So the city manager's office that encompasses um, HR, community engagement, the city recorder budget, um, and then like other various ones. So for that one, we had around a $210,000 savings. So we were able to take some from that. And that was partially from not rehiring the ACM, not hiring the HR manager and not rehiring the community engagement manager. And then thankfully not hiring a city manager until later because Will was continued to be paid out of the library budget. So that was, that was helpful. Um, the general office appropriation is increasing 25,000. We've just had a lot more mailers regarding the urban renewal and then rate review commission is also having some mailers. So that just increased our postage for this year. Uh, finance was able to have a savings of 50,000 because we didn't hire the financial analyst this year. So that helped. Um, IT needs an increase of 100,000. We had some emergency purchases related to the servers that just could not wait till next fiscal year, unfortunately. So we needed to make those and try and shuffle some money around in this fund. The legal budget is just like right on the line. So I wanted to make sure it wouldn't go over with the June billing. So we increased that by 50,000 just to kind of make sure we're on point there. The public works is increasing 262,000 um, related to vehicle purchases from the fund 32 money. So this one came directly from the contingency that was left over because that was all assigned for the vehicle replacement. 
And then um, our insurance had to increase by 75,000 because we've had additional workers comp claims throughout the year, which has increased our insurance costs. So it, it's a lot, but it all works out. So, uh, you know, the departments can give to each other. Next slide. The building inspection fund, um, the building inspection appropriation has an increase of 100,000. This was just to account to additional professional services and maintenance agreements that they've had throughout the year. And the offset came from contingency. Next slide. The economic development fund, the planning appropriation increased around 50,000. And that's just to offset some professional services related to the urban renewal that we had to purchase. And that offset came from contingency. Next slide. And then TLT fund. So as I said, we we're anticipating around a $400,000 increase from this quarter four revenue that's coming in. And so that just offsets what we do for general government. So Taste Newberg's contract will go up accordingly based on our TLT split. And then the general fund will receive that other portion of the split. Next slide. And then ARPA, based on the round three, we had to add that police appropriation from the bulletproof glass that have passed. And then that was taken from the economic development appropriation because that's where we plugged it from the first supplemental budget because we weren't sure how that was gonna get allocated. And that's it. All righty. Um, so any public testimony on this item? Mr. Mayor, I have received no public testimony for the supplemental budget. All right, I will close public testimony then. The recommendation from staff, please. I recommend approving resolution 3832. All righty. Council, questions? That I will uh, entertain a motion then. I move we approve RCA 3832. Second. Mike with a second. Any further discussion? All righty. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Hearing none, that passes. All righty. Thank you, Katie. All righty. I suggest we take a five minute break uh, before we do this uh, last item of business this evening is the District 2 Council interviews. So if we, uh, and the motion to appoint. Um, so let's take five minutes to be back here at 821. Thank you. Let's bring this meeting back into session. All right, this is council business item number 10A, District 2 Council Interviews. Um, and we have four candidates. We are blessed to have four people interested in joining us um, for all of this fun. So anyway, uh, they are Casey Banks, Peggy Kilberg, David Reed, and Daniel Lindsay. Um, so, councilors, you have before you uh, in, or in your packets information on each of the candidates. We also have a list of questions that were published on the website. Um, and then you also have a scoring sheet uh, for each of these. So I'll suggest um, that we go around and each of us ask um, a question um, and then we'll just go. I've got it in that order. Just I think that was the order that the applications were submitted. So uh, Casey being number one, Peggy two, David three, and Daniel four. Um, so let's um, let's lead off. Stephanie. I just want to make sure, is the scoring scale one to 10? Uh, let's go one to five. One to five, easier easier for math. For my math. Maybe 10 to you, but anyway. Yeah, well, Katie's here, so we're, we're okay. We, we'll, we're, we'll, we'll get somebody who's, who can add in the room, so that's good. I was gonna ask uh, oh, sorry, five's high, five's high, all right. <laughs> y'all is y'all are rule specific all right so five five being high all right all right um so i will lead off so casey good evening good evening all right please tell us about yourself and why you're interested in serving as a counselor thank you for having me um i am originally from missouri so i'm a midwestern at heart i moved to the pacific northwest in 2016 and specifically to newburgh in 2020 uh, during the pandemic with my husband and toddler. Um, I moved for a job. I serve as a pastor of a church here in town uh, that is passionate about feeding people and welcoming the marginalized. Um, I see my primary gift as teaching. I am a curious person, lifelong learner, and I've been told that I ask good questions. I've always been passionate about politics, uh, which I understand to be the way that we order our common life together. 
Um, and I have a strong value on community. And I believe that if you have power and influence, you gotta use it to improve the welfare of those around you. I'm interested in serving simply because there's an empty seat at the table and conversations are always better when there's more voices at the table. Um, I believe you're most likely to find the best candidate for this position uh, when you have more people uh, to choose from. So I'm simply making myself available in case my community decides it needs me in this way. Um, I think that my voice would add the perspective of uh, not only a newer resident, but also one who is a renter. And I'm not certain if that perspective is currently represented on the council. All right, thank you. Denise, would you ask the, the Peggy the next question? I heard the same question again. No, why don't, uh, not really, I'd rather do them all at once. Well, yeah. Switch my, oh, what well, do you guys no. think? Oh, no, so why does, you just want to hammer Casey first? With all the four <laughs> questions? You got to Casey, you're the first. I don't know, I mean, is that it? I, well, yeah, the night of the center seat's going to get hot, like people keep coming up. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's it. Uh, sorry. What is your understanding of the role of the counselor and the time commitment? Given this, what has prepared you to be a counselor? Well, I understand the city council to be a governing body where the counselors are responsible for setting a vision. Um, and then they create policies and align resources uh, to achieve that vision. They set a direction for the city staff to follow um, and offer clearly defined boundaries. Um, but the council uh, at its best is not supposed to micromanage the staff um, to create a, uh, a process of high trust in um, the city staff. I understand council meets uh, twice a month on Monday evenings. Um, there's opportunities to serve on additional city committees possibly, and that this particular seat appointment ends in December. A few of the things that have prepared me to be a counselor. Um, I did six years of competitive policy debate in persuasive speaking in school. So that's a huge passion of mine. Um, I've done some international travel, uh, mostly Europe and in Africa, uh, plus studied intercultural studies. Um, and I find that that helps me to view problems from multiple angles um, and to be able to like play devil's advocate um, for the sake of arriving at the best possible solution in the end. Uh, as an active member of my faith community, I've served on a bunch of different administrative committees um, and currently lead a few of those now, um, both at the local level, but I've also served as delegates to uh, state, regional, and global legislative bodies within my uh, faith community. Um, so I have experience uh, defining mission, setting vision, um, drafting and approving budgets, uh, working with trustees, um, assessing programs for their fruitfulness, as well as a little bit of experience lately supervising staff members. Thank you. In regards to uh, the adoptive five council goals, Explain how uh, you will promote these goals. Do I need to read those off? Or have, she's already no, she should have. Okay. How would you how would you promote those goals? I wrote a bunch of notes on these, and I'm not sure how much you would like to hear. Um, I took notes on all but A because um, I'm not as familiar with uh, goal A. But for the rest, um, developing an operational culture that adopts and it cherishes diversity, equity, and inclusion as core values. Um, first, I believe you got to practice these in yourself first and then practice them openly uh, in both words and actions. Um, last year, I actually led my church through a year long focus on anti racism, and we did multiple books and online courses that addressed white privilege and uh, systemic racism. Um, as part of my professional life, I periodically take trainings that address intercultural competency. Um, harassment, uh, treatment of the vulnerable, um, and as well as learn strategies to be more inclusive. Um, so one of those strategies that I've been learning is how to facilitate groups using a mutual invitation, uh, which is a method that kind of honors cultures that are not 
uh, prone to interrupt or to speak up without invitation. Um, and so I would love to uh, bring some of those strategies and learn from others on ways that we can uh, kind of de-center some of the uh, decision-making methods that potentially exclude some people from sharing their voice fully. On the third goal about promoting development of affordable housing, um, this is a huge passion topic of mine. Uh, this year, I'm leading my congregation through a year-long focus on affordable housing. So we've been reading the housing reports from the city and the Portland area. We've been learning what cities and churches in the Portland metro area have been doing to address this in their communities. And the church is actually in the process of developing um, a housing project in Dundee in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Um, I'm really excited about like the new zoning codes for cottage clusters. And I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of housing communities that creates here. I would love to um, have some conversations as a city about a legal pathway for tiny houses or micro apartments um, that can serve maybe both college students and single person households. Uh, we all know that a huge hurdle to this is the not in my backyard sentiment. I feel like we've heard a little bit of that tonight, even with the car camping. But there are cities who have had um, affordable housing projects and uh, neighbors have testified that those projects actually um, uh, did not reduce property values and it did reduce crime in the area. Um, so I'd love to find a way to share some of those testimonies and um, kind of have some of those heart conversations that are needed to address the not in my backyard kind of mentality. Um, just anecdotally, my church is one of those in the city that has the physical assets to participate in some kind of a city sponsored safe parking program. But what we don't have is the human resources needed to offer those wraparound services. Um, so if I were added as a counselor, I'd love to be a part of your conversations. Uh, to help the city find a path forward for those communities that want to offer this um, and give them the, the resources they need to actually do it successfully. Uh, for the fourth goal about the Urban Renewal Plan and Authority, um, I've read it, but this is an area that I need to learn more about in order to be a good advocate for it. But one thing I'm good at is thinking through how to take um, kind of specialized content and repackage it, teach it to a broader audience so that you don't have to have the specialized knowledge on it. And um, it sounds like there's some rumors that maybe the city has to do some citywide education about the plan. Um, so that might be something that I could help uh, to support the city goals on that. And then collaborating with local partners and entities to develop a sustainability program. Um, this is something my family cares a lot about. We have had the, I guess, privilege of being in cities that had more sustainability programs, uh, including citywide composting. Um, and so it kind of like hurt a little in the heart to move to Newburgh and not have a program like that available. Um, so I would love to support any city efforts to promote, um, you know, solar panels or composting, uh, electric vehicle charging stations, um, encourage more biodiversity in people's front yards, um, variety of things. And one thing that I uh, experienced a few years ago was a report by, um, it was my Washington state representative. She'd taken a trip to, I think it was Denmark and came back into this presentation on this philosophy on solving problems um, in municipalities in Denmark where for every solution the city invests in, it has to solve two problems, at least two problems. Um, so they uh, found a way to be more financially sustainable um, by only looking at uh, solutions that could solve at least two or more of their problems. Um, and so that was a really great way to take care of their environment and their uh, financial resources as well. I think that covers um, all the goals except that first one. Describe one thing in relation to these goals that you see going well in Newburgh and one thing that you would like to see improved? Yes. Well, it sounds like there's some really great long-term visioning happening. There's not just the five or even 10 year plan, there's the 20 year and 30 year uh, vision that's happening. 
And it looks like, um, like you recognize that you may not see um, the end result yourself. You may not be there to uh, see the, the final result, but like you're doing your piece now um, to set up tomorrow's leaders uh, to finish the course. Um, and so I love that idea that it's not about what uh, we can achieve today necessarily, but how can we do our part to make sure that there's this long-term uh, vitality for the city? And I see that especially through the urban renewal plan um, and just really excited about the possibility of the city someday having a vibrant waterfront presence, um, knowing that I myself may not even see that. Um, uh, I don't know if, uh, if I'll even get to see like that side of, of the vision. One thing for improvement, um, I love all this research that y'all are investing in for uh, learning about this affordable housing crisis. One thing I'm worried about is the pace at which these solutions can actually meet the need. This isn't unique to Newburgh. This is um, kind of universal across our, our country. Um, solutions that take five, 10, 20 years to development obviously aren't helping residents today. So I would love to see our city focus on um, themselves sponsoring projects that have an immediate impact like the car camping program. Um, while creating the legal pathways needed that would let other folks like developers create those more longer term solutions. Um, this is something that you know I experienced firsthand in Newburgh. Uh, I myself, highly educated, good paying job, and yet my own family had to decide uh, when, I, when I got the job in Newburgh, are we gonna live in the community um, and be part of the community where the people live that I serve? Um, and rent a small apartment to be there? Or are we going to um, pursue the American dream of uh, owning or even just renting a single family home in a different community that's more affordable? Um, so I would love for us to figure out a way that the people who make the city uh, work, you know, people at all levels of the, uh, uh, the working field, um, that they can all live in one community together um, so that we're really a complete and whole community. All righty. Well, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Elise, do you want to uh, ask the first question of Peggy? Yeah, that'd be great if you could. And it's the button to the right, I think. Huh? There's the light. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi, Hi, Elise. Okay, tell us about yourself and why you are interested in serving as a counselor. Yes, I've given this some thought. I, I uh, started getting interested in the council meetings uh, six months or so ago, and especially when you started meeting in person, it was much more engaging, and I was learning more and realized this is interesting. And um, I have been in Newburgh. Uh, all but about 10 years of my adult life when I first came down to go to George Fox. And I raised my four kids here for the most part. And I realized I've never really given back. And this town, I mean, church, friends, neighbors, parks, old fashioned festival, parades, the kids were on the, you know, the floats. It, it was just a great place to raise my family. So I, um, was fortunate enough to retire a few years early. And so seven years later, here I am, almost seven years later, I feel like stepping up is the right thing to do. I think I would enjoy it. I know it's not always easy. No job is always easy or fun, right? But I do think overall, I would enjoy it and find satisfaction. And I also believe I could make a co positive contribution on the council. All right, what is your understanding of the role of a counselor and the time commitment? Given this, what has prepared you to be a counselor? Okay, thank you. Um, I saw a brief description on the website of the, of course with my HR background, I'm like, well, that's kind of short. Um, anyway, I know you meet twice a week or twice, no, not twice a week, twice a month on Mondays, unless it was a holiday. And I realize each counselor is expected to serve on one or two uh, committees or boards as well. Um, and then besides that, 
uh, I th obviously the, your role would involve having a good understanding of the topics that are coming up on the agenda. And um, because I'm retired and I have very few other commitments, I, I could come up to speed, I think, quickly. I would enjoy investing the time to learn as I go. I also have the full support of my husband, which is important to me. Um, I, I just like learning. I've been that way since I was a little girl. I have to say, though, I mean, I could, I know several of you are working full time. Some have your businesses, you're raising your family, and you're doing this. I truly, it's, a, it's remarkable to me. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that job description, um, the things I've mentioned setting policy, approving the budget are, of course, very important. And I think both of those involve getting facts, gathering information, and then making good decisions based on those facts. So my 30 plus years in human resources, I believe would serve me really well in these areas. Um, I was called upon to make countless decisions of so many types. Um, I had to consider claims of discrimination, harassment. Uh, was it time to put somebody on a corrective action plan or was the supervisor jumping the gun? Um, which health insurance provider we should use and what plans we should offer our employees. Um, we also, um, I was very involved in setting up a compensation plan for our employees, uh, a merit plan, and then just determining what each new position, what, what pay range it was on. So setting up the compensation for those. There were lots of things. Lots of those were tough jobs or tough decisions, not always popular, but, and I never always got it 100% right. I, no one could, but I asked questions. I listened carefully. I learned everything I could. I sought input from other stakeholders or sometimes just my boss in the president's cabinet. Um, I weighed the facts and then I moved ahead accordingly. And that's, that's what, what you have to do. Uh, I probably have less experience in big budget I, I ran a department with five employees, um, but most of the HR budget was benefits. So those are anything I would particularly set, just managing salaries and expenses. Um, anyway, I guess that's plenty. Council adopted five goals for 2020. Explain how you would promote these goals. Okay. So I want to preface my comments by just admitting I don't know all that's been accomplished in each of those five goal areas yet or what remains to be done. So I was trying to think in terms of what could, what would I do to promote the goals if they haven't been done already. So um, the, the goal of strong customer service especially resonates with me. I spent the first 12 years of my career at HP and it was a core value uh, at HP to have customer satisfaction. So um, it's like I cut my teeth on it, I guess, but I actually <coughs> took part of that, that with me to George Fox and tried to implement it there as well. Um, so to promote customer satisfaction, and I'm guessing Will is working on this already, but if not, I'd recommend that Will and other managers set customer service expectations on the part of their employees, maybe in their job descriptions, ensure the employees have what they need to be successful. For example, it could be training in customer satisfaction or customer service, and then hold each employee accountable through ongoing feedback and perhaps through the uh, formal review process as well to measure and again, hold them accountable. And also I put forth a suggestion when I filled up my application uh, for more transparency with residents on the part of the uh, city council. And I think by doing that, whether it's through this new system you have for billing or putting a note in the email with the water bills, keep the communication coming to the citizens. That would, um, increase trust, but I think it would also improve customer satisfaction, you know, because we're each, right, we're each a customer as far as our water bills go. I even, you know, you just kind of free, free flowing at night, I thought it might be kind of fun to call it, you know, a word from Will 
or something, you know, every month. Oh. So it was friendly. It wasn't this nameless entity, <laughs> but you know, something where they expect it or maybe ruminations from Rick. I don't know who, which one, you know. <laughs> no, no, um, no. <laughs> you like that? Okay. I it's, you it's, might. it's funny, I used to do that at the library. It was a letter from Mr. Will, but I did oh, feel that this is not really, I don't know. No, it's fine. I, I was just kind of half kidding. But um, even with that communication, you would want to have metrics. So you would know, are we, are we getting better? Do we have better uh, customer satisfaction? Would it be because there were fewer complaints and or more kudos? You know, those are just simple things I could think of. Okay, and then of course with HR, I love getting legal disputes done, <laughs> taken care of, right? So don't know where you're at with that. I know there've been challenges. Yeah, yeah, look at the attorney, yeah. So I would just encourage the council, if you haven't already, but work with James, work with Will, and uh, come up with some decisions that would allow you to have resolutions that are reasonable, expedient, and fiscally palatable. So if you can hit that trifecta, I think you're you could move, you know, you're quicker to move on. Um, and then the second one, operational culture that adopts and cherishes diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, I would need to get a read on where you're at with that. But um, Hello? I did serve on the diversity committee at George Fox for 10 plus years, I think as long as there was a diversity committee. Now, when I retired in 2015, um, the diversity, equity, inclusion terms had not been coined yet, but we did essentially this same work, uh, making sure we had good representation, people were treated fairly, opportunities, and so on. Um, so as far as the city goes, I would just want to encourage you to be sure employment decisions, other public service um, services decisions are made with fairness and treating everyone uh, with respect, let's see, I said fairness, respect, and care. So if you're doing that, I think you're, you're well on the way. Um, then, of course, housing affordability. And Casey alluded, well, she didn't just allude to it. I mean, we all know it's very layered. It's almost like a Rubik's Cube. You know, there's things going this way, things going that way. From people who are spending too much money um, from their paychecks on either mortgage or rent, to people who need a hand up to get back on their feet with a job and to be able to afford uh, and find a house to live in, to creating an environment where businesses will come to Newburgh, provide us well-paying jobs so people can afford more. So it's not just the cost of something, it's what, what can we do to help your revenue, right? Your income go up. Um, so none of these is simple. And of course, then the availability of the housing is driving the price up because of supply and demand. So I think just learning as much as we can, possibly thinking outside the box. Are there other cities similar to us in size and type that we could see what they've done? Do we have small plots of land around Newburgh that could be used for housing that aren't maybe zoned that way right now? Um, and then I'd also like to just better understand what goes into the cost of building a house in Newburgh. Um, and I'm happy to talk to some realtors and see what, see what uh, costs are uh, incurred at City Hall as well. So anyway, those are my thoughts there. Urban Renewal Plan and Authority. I, I mean, that's an accomplishment, right? That's in your accomplishments column because you did pass it. I am sure there's much work ahead that I don't, know yet and i would look forward to learning more about that um about what's what's next and and reading more detail about it and then the sustainability program i was really impressed when i started looking around on the website i just hadn't paid attention to this stuff um and we are fortunate enough my husband and i we live on a on a lot that um has shahalem creek as our northern border up there by jakewood park and so that I saw the trees for streams and I thought, oh, that's smart, you know, for erosion control. My crazy husband, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, built a three or four foot retaining wall out of Manor Stone, the entire border of our property because he was worried about the erosion. So we don't have, we don't have room for any little trees. <laughs> that's okay. Um, 
And I don't know how much collaboration the city has done with the with ICLAI, which I had to look up, by the way. But here are some things that really impressed me, the water efficiency kits that are available just for the asking, um, the watershed grants, the sidewalk repair grants and loans, uh, converting the fixtures in the city buildings to LED, um, and then the solar powered school and crosswalk lights. You know, I see them all the time, right? But I had no idea they were solar powered. So anyway, these are just a few things I, I thought were really good practical programs um, that make real differences in our in our community. Um, and then I'm the old mill property. I know it's part of the urban renewal plan, but and I'm guessing uh, some sustainability environmental improvements are probably already in the plan right for that property. That would be a huge thing to make sure happens. Wow, thank you. I, I wasn't sure how much time I'd have for that. All right, um, and then given these goals, can you tell us one thing that you see going well in Newburgh and one that you'd like to see improved of these goals? Yes, um, again, I go back to the passage of the urban renewal plan uh, because I, I know for sure that's, an, that's a success, that's going well. Um, and without knowing the other areas, not so much. I also think you're doing well with sustainability goals as well. Um, and then as far as improvement, I'm gonna go right back to customer satisfaction kind of near and dear to my heart. And, you know, I know each city employee has a set of internal and probably some external customers as well. But I also believe the city council, council has a role in customer satisfaction. So um, just going back to that transparency and taking every opportunity you can, especially through your new billing system or whatever, however those bills will go out now, um, I really think you would see uh, some changes, some, some improvements. And I don't think you're awful. I don't want to give that impression. But I did get a lot of feedback once people thought, found out I was interested in this job, you know. And if you ask for feedback, of course, you, you only get the negative, right, for the most part. So um, I would just hearken back to the customer satisfaction. We can always do better. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity All very right, much. Thank you. Hi. Uh, tell us uh, about yourself and why you're interested in serving as a councilman. Sure, absolutely. So my name is David Reed. I uh, grew up just outside of Newburgh between Newburgh and Sherwood. Um, lived there my whole life. I went to George Fox University. Um, I grew up playing in parks, so thanks, Mike, for all the work you've done on this. Uh, I uh, worked in China and Rwanda and then moved back here in 2019 and lived in various apartments. And finally, just last October, we were able to buy our first house here in town. So we're very excited about that. And I've been looking for a way to be involved more with the city and local government. And I saw this opportunity and thought this would be a great way for an interim kind of try this out and see how I like it and see how it works. Um, yeah, and then I work for, a, for the last three and a half years, I've worked for a company that designs interactive, interpretive and design exhibits for national parks, state parks, um, US Fish and Wildlife, US Forest Service, local governments. And so I've been working a lot with cities in that regard and it seemed really fun and I seem to like it and making our community, community spaces better. And I'm looking forward to doing that in Newburgh. <laughs> yeah, so for the role of the counselor, um, I think there's two main things. One is to evaluate proposals and uh, help create policy. Um, and the second is to listen to the fellow citizens. So um, in the creating, I went on to the Oregon League of City Councils and watched all their videos. <laughs> so um, I think I understand how the whole process works. And uh, um, I think helping plan for the future of the city and creating the direction 
for not just in the next five, 10 years, but further down the road is super important. And then uh, listening to the constituents and um, helping have their voices be heard in the city, I think is the most important thing. And in my current work, I work as a purchaser, project manager, uh, logistics coordinator. Um, so I'm dealing with budgets and cost estimates and proposals for these large uh, city grants and stuff. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I think that has prepared me to um, try out this role. So council adopted five goals for 2020, five goals listed. How will you promote these goals? Well, first off, I want to say I'm really thankful to live in a city that has these goals as the goals that they're focusing on, because I um, that makes me excited. And I really appreciate that. Um, I think the way one of the best ways to promote these goals is to filter all decisions that are made through these goals when evaluating and listening to citizens comments and um, proposals and even, you know, zoning rules and stuff, seeing how these goals interact with those. Um, yeah. Describe one thing in relation to these goals that you see going well in Newburgh and one thing you would like to see improved. Uh, so one of the first goals that leaped off to me was the um, goal B, the diversity and equity inclusion goals. I think that I wanna live in a city where that is encouraged. And I think we are doing a really good job of that. I appreciate all the work that's gone into proclamations and library events and um, the continued improvement of that in our city. And then in terms of things that I'd like to see improve, improved, um, obviously affordable housing is a crucial issue as we're well aware. And um, as we recently were trying to buy a house and looking at the lack of supply and increased costs, I think that is someplace that definitely needs to be improved. And there's gonna be a lot of factors that go into changing that. All righty, um, perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Good deal. All right, and where are we here? Denise, do you want to? Uh... Tell us about yourself and why you are interested in serving as a counselor. Is that for me? Oh, yeah, sorry, Daniel, can you hear us? Sorry. Okay, it broke up there a bit. I hear you now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I have lived in Newburgh since the second grade. Yeah, sounds about right. Uh, I've lived in uh, not the same house, but the same neighborhood for the most time. This second district, I guess, is what it is. Um, I've just grown up here. Uh, I'm familiar with all the schools in the area and all the churches and everything. Go past them every day. Uh and so I'm just interested in kind of contributing to where I've grown up uh, my whole life for the most part. Uh, I think Newburgh has a lot of unique advantages uh, that could be used to further a lot of the goals that uh, have been listed. Uh, and I think a lot of progress has been made, but there uh, is always more that can be done. Um, and I feel like I have some input to contribute. And I also have uh, a history in customer service, which I can use uh, to kind of listen to the community and incorporate what they're saying uh, and kind of just talk with them and have a dialogue. Uh, is this me now? No, it is. All right. What is your understanding of the role of a counselor and the time commitment? Given this, what has prepared you to be a counselor? So obviously it's the two meetings and as well as the uh, other uh, positions, the other uh, committees. Uh, and I'm very prepared to do that. I'm lucky enough to have a job where I can be flexible with my time and I can make time for this. No problem. 
no problem. Uh, and as well, I'm fully uh, able to and excited to uh, kind of do more than just the meetings. I'd really like to uh, connect more and do more to breed a community, uh, a sense of community, uh, kind of more than I've experienced uh, growing up uh, in this city. So the council adopted five goals in 2022. Uh, explain how you will promote these goals. Well, obviously on the council, uh, a lot of it uh, from what I've seen, because uh, I've been watching a little bit from the sidelines, uh, is a dialogue with the community, uh, listening uh, as well as discussing with them. I, obviously there's always disagreements. Um, but I think just getting to a place where people can understand each other and to also try and uh, adjust things like pe people, even if someone disagrees and you don't necessarily agree with their disagreement, I find it very interesting just listening just because there's always something you can pick out, uh, like the main kind of pearl that they've kind of globbed their issue onto. And I think it's really satisfying to find that and then address the core issue. Um, they may not address everything that they dislike. Um, I th it's obviously really hard to get a complete consensus on something, but I think uh, input from everyone can help improve this. So uh, yeah, in terms of like the five goals and promoting them and stuff, uh, I would just love to be able to kind of evangelize them, uh, improve upon them, and just discuss them with people. Uh, I'm a big fan of what we've done with uh, the housing. Uh, I know it kind of wasn't the city's choice. Um, Oregon kind of passed that, but it was uh, very proactive of Newburgh to implement the uh, large city requirements um, just ahead of time. Uh, and I think those are ultimately kind of the best ones for not just large cities, but I'm glad that we implemented them. And that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of it. So Daniel, of these goals, um, which ones uh, do you think we're doing really well and which ones could we still improve on? I, I mean, so the customer service, I'll start with improvements. I think that could definitely be improved, making information uh, a bit more accessible and easier to digest rather than just large PDFs or docs uh, that someone has to comb through. Uh, kind of like, yeah, just some way for the average person to sift through what's going on. Um, in terms of what's being done really well, uh, I think the diversity and inclusion initiatives are going really well. Uh, I had a few small conversations with uh, the counselor of this seat before he left, and I had a great time talking with him, and I was glad he was my representative, um, as well as working on affordable housing and houselessness and transitional housing. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to still be done, but I am I I'm encouraged that I am seeing work done because there's a lot of cities that just aren't, <laughs> uh, or at least aren't putting a lot of uh, good faith effort into it. All righty. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that is the end of our set questions. Um, so the next step will be, um, if I can actually, uh, ask Katie to, uh, I'll run them over to you, uh, to tally up, uh, uh, this is, I mean, this is, this is the way we do it. So you get to sit here and now we'll add everything up and we'll, we'll go from there. So yeah, um, give us a little bit and we'll be right back.
So for the candidates, there's there's only one position open, obviously. And, um, you know, I've only been with the council here since March. Uh, incredibly enjoyable opportunity. Um, and you all are very impressive. I would love to work with every one of you. And I mean that sincerely. So um, if, it, if you are not selected, please consider um, taking another volunteer position on another committee um, with the city. You all have talents that we need desperately. And um, we just, you know, everybody's voice is welcome and we just need people to, to fill those roles. So thank you. Just to on that a little bit, we did a tally at one point not too, too long ago, and we generally use about 100 volunteers between standing and ad hoc committees. So we are always looking for folks. So keep that in mind. And who knows, we might even do a car camping committee. Never know. Never know. Right. Actually, speaking of that, this is a public service announcement, actually, or uh, city recorders today. The, uh, if you are considering filing for a position, August 19th is the deadline. Correct? Okay. So there you go. If you are considering it, please consider it. No, no. Okay, here we go. Oh, flower of Scotland, <laughs> when will we see your like again that fought and died for a wee bit hill and glen and sent them homewards? Proud Edward's armies and sent them homewards to think again. Do you need the next verse, Katie? Or... <laughs> oh, cousin, that just made my heart proud there, cousin. I got a little tear here. I need a right, let's, let's bring one back a little bit to Newburgh, shall we? When you hear the words we say, oh, when you hear the words we say, oh, when you hear the words we say, you know Newburgh's here to play. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. there you go. All right. It is, uh, it has now been tallied, verified, and legally approved. Um, and Peggy, we're happy to say you are on the next district two counselor. Thank you. Congratulations. Mr. Congratulations. Mayor. Congratulations. Yeah. Rick, Rick, I do need a formal motion for the record. It's, it's, it's in the staff report. It is, it is. All right. Um, we'll need a motion. Mr. Mayor. I moved to appoint Peggy and I closed my computer so I can't remember her last name as a uh, counselor for district two. And could we add just uh, for a term ending December 31st, 2022 and to be sworn in at the July 5th, 2022 city council meeting. Right, thanks. Said. Second. All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. There it is, Peggy, that's the official welcome. <laughs> And, and again, to echo what uh, what Jefferson said, please, please, please keep in mind um, other other positions. In fact, all of you in the room, remember, there are other volunteer opportunities here at the city of Newburgh. So thank you all. We're adjourned.